Hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 Neurosarcoidosis Patient Day. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here with us for what's set to be another fantastic patient day that we've created specifically for sarcoidosis patients. My name is Leo, I'm the Senior Executive here at Sarcoidosis UK and I'm going to be co-hosting today's event with the Sarcoidosis UK Patient Ambassador Jackie. Now I'm sure most of the people watching today will know who Jackie is uh, from the fantastic work that she does for Sarcoidosis UK. Um, hello Jackie. Hi everyone and uh, thanks Leo. Yeah, it's great to be doing this here with you today Jackie. Um, now, before we get started today, I want to just run through a few details about how today is going to work. Now, we are currently streaming live to Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So hello to you all, wherever you're watching from. Um, now, a couple of people have asked as well already, will this patient day be recorded? And the answer is yes, it will be recorded and available to watch after the event. So if you want to rewatch a certain part of it, or if you miss part of the patient day, that's absolutely fine. You will be able to watch it after the event too. Um, I also wanted to quickly run through the programme with everyone so everyone knows what to expect. So if I just share my screen with you all, we'll quickly talk through the programme and see what's coming today. So we're going to start off with our Sarcoidosis UK introduction, which will be given by me and Jackie, and that will take us through until half past two. And then at half past two, we will hand over to Dr. Kidd for a fascinating talk about neurosarcoidosis treatment and management. And that will be from half past two until 10 past three. At 10 past three, we'll have our first 10 minute break. And then after that 10 minute break, we'll hand over to Professor Brewer, who will be giving the very important talk on the role of exercise and nutrition in the management and control of sarcoidosis. Now that talk will be from 20 past three until four o'clock. Um, and after that talk, we will have our second 10 minute comfort break. After that break, we will be having two sort of discussion pieces. Our first one will be a round table talk where all of the speakers will be talking about topics relating to sarcoidosis, neurosarcoidosis, and we'll also be talking about what we want to see in the future. And straight away after that, at 16.50, we will be having our Q&A session where the speakers from today's patient day will be answering questions that have been sent in to us over the last few weeks. Now, we have had a lot of questions sent in already, but I imagine quite a lot will come up throughout the course of the day as well. So we are keeping an eye on the comments on um, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So if you do have any questions, do leave us a comment. We will be reviewing those and adding those to the list. And then during that Q&A session, we will try to get through as many as possible. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen. I will hand you over to Jackie, who will introduce our speakers for the day. Hello, thank you, Leo. So again, we've got Dr. Kidd, the UK expert in neurosarcoid and neuroinflammatory diseases. He sits on our local board at Sarcoidosis UK and he is a champion 
for neurosarcoid patients. Hello, Dr. Kidd. Sorry, hello. <laughs> I didn't realize I was coming on so quickly. <laughs> oh, you're not, we're just saying hello. <laughs> oh, I see, well, I go away again then. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving up your day for us. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm really pleased that we're uh, talking about these particular topics as well, which I think are, um, are increasingly important as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, then I'll introduce our next speaker after Dr. Kidd, and that is Professor John Brewer, who specialises in research into fitness standards and nutrition and has written a number of books on track event training, which would exhaust most of us just by reading them. So hello, Professor John Brewer. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jackie. Hi. Thanks for coming on, helping us out today. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Professor Brewer, and thank you to Dr. Kidd. It's so great to have you here with us today, and we are really excited for, for today's patient day. Now, I am going to take a little bit of time now to talk to you a bit about Sarcoidosis UK um, and the work we do, as well as giving some updates about exciting things that have come up in the last few weeks and some exciting things that we've got coming up in the next few weeks as well. So again, I will share my screen. Now, hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, as a charity, we have four aims, and they are to provide information about sarcoidosis, to provide support to anybody affected, to raise awareness of the condition, and of course, to fund research into a cure for sarcoidosis. Now, I wanna go into a bit more detail about each of these aims and also provide some updates about some exciting things we've got going on at the moment. So let's talk in a bit more detail about information. So we provide information and we provide accurate and detailed information to sarcoidosis patients, but not just patients, also to their carers and to medical professionals as well. And we do this in a couple of ways. We do this through our online presence. We do this through our patient days like today. We do this through our patient information videos and our Q&A videos. And whilst we're talking about Q&A videos, just a date for everyone's diaries. Our next Q&A video will be this Thursday, Thursday the 1st of July at 2 p.m., where we're going to be talking about PIP and the application process for PIP and everything that a sarcoidosis patient who's applying for PIP needs to know. And that will be on Thursday, 1st of July at 2 p.m., and I will be joined by the brilliant Sarcoidosis UK nurse, Jenny, who will be sharing her knowledge and her expertise about PIP. Um, one final thing on information. We also have patient information leaflets for anyone who's not aware. And these are all available on our website. We have leaflets on each of the different sarcoid manifestations, as well as some non-organ specific leaflets too. For example, we have a leaflet on information for employers. All of these are available to download for free on our website. Or if you would rather have a physical copy of the leaflets, you can also request those on our website too. Our second major aim as an organisation is to fund research into a cure for sarcoidosis. We really do work incredibly hard to raise enough funds to fund at least one major piece of research a year. And to ensure greater efficiency and maximise on our investment into research, we work in partnership with the British Lung Foundation on these projects. And the British Lung Foundation double our research budget. So I think this is important to know for anyone who has donated to Sarcoidosis UK in the past, or perhaps is planning to in the future, please know that any funds that we put towards research are doubled by the British Lung Foundation. And that means that any donation, no matter how big or small, will have an even bigger impact. Also, just a very quick update on our research. We've got some exciting new updates. In the last month or so, we have produced two new interim reports on two of our ongoing research projects. So they are for our 2017 research grant, where we did a project analysing breath samples from sarcoidosis patients in order to try and understand more about the cause of sarcoidosis. And we also produced a report on our 2019 research project, which was a laboratory analysis of sarcoidosis scarring in the lungs. And the aim of that research was to try and understand a bit more about the scarring process and we hope it will be used to inform clinical trials and may, e may 
even be able to enable new treatment options. So these are very exciting projects and you can read these interim reports on our websites. I would love to go into it a bit, go into a bit more detail now, but we are on a very strict time schedule today. So please do head over to our website after the patient day today and have a read of those interim reports and you'll see exactly how Dr. Fowler and Dr. Jones are getting on with these fascinating and very exciting research projects. We are also really looking forward to announcing the winner of our 2020 Sarcoidosis UK research grant. We haven't got the go ahead to announce it just yet, but hoping that in the next few weeks we will be able to do that. And as soon as we are able to, I will share that information with you all. I would also like to make sure that everyone who is watching today is aware of the support that Sarcoidosis UK offers to anybody affected by sarcoidosis. We provide support through our Sarcoidosis UK Nurse Helpline, and that is a free and confidential helpline that is run by two of our Sarcoidosis UK nurses. Now, our Sarcoidosis UK nurses are NHS nurses who have either personal or professional experience of sarcoidosis. So they really can provide good quality support relating to your sarcoidosis. So if you would like some extra support and like to speak to someone who can understand what you're going through, please do get in contact with us in the office. We would be happy to schedule a call for you. Otherwise, you can do that through the support hub sec section on our website. You can request a call back there. Another fantastic source of support for patients is our Sarcoidosis UK support groups. Now, these run at different geographical locations around the UK. You can see this on the map here on the left of my screen. And they are a fantastic opportunity for patients to meet with other patients, to share their experiences, to learn from each other's experience and to provide support and, and feel heard by people who will understand what you're going through a bit better. Now, this summer, in the summer of 2021, we're hoping to expand our support group network so that we can start to cover areas of the country that might not currently have access to a support group. So if you think that you might be interested in getting involved with the charity and setting up a support group in your area so that sarcoidosis patients have access to that support, I would absolutely love to hear from you. So please do get in touch with me at any time on leo at sarcoidosisuk.org and we can have a chat about setting up a support group. And I, of course, would be there to help you with anything you need every step of the way. Now, our fourth very important aim is to raise awareness of sarcoidosis. We absolutely recognize the, the lack of awareness if, of, and understanding about sarcoidosis from both members of the general public and members of the uh, medical profession too. And we really would like to change this. So I want to talk to you a bit about the advocacy work we're involved with. We are involved in advocacy work with the European Lung Foundation and also the British Thoracic Society, with whom I'm working on the sarcoidosis patient registry. And I'm also very happy to announce here today for the first time that I have been accepted onto the task force for lung health, where I will be representing sarcoidosis patients um, with the aim of improving the care of people with lung disease in the UK. And within the, within the task force for lung health, there is also a smaller working group that looks at diagnosis. So I'm also going to be representing sarcoidosis patients there and making sure that people know about the difficulties that sarcoidosis patients face at diagnosis. So I really look forward to updating you with the progress that's been made there as well. One final thing from me before I hand you back over to Jackie for her talk. I would just like to say a really huge heartfelt thank you to everybody who has supported us over the last year and a half. The last year and a half has been really, really hard for sarcoidosis patients and, and also for UK charities. And we really would not have been able to do some of the really important things we've done over the last year and a half had it not been for your support. So I really do need to and want to say a big thank you to our volunteers, to our supporters, to our fundraisers, to anyone who's donated um, either their time or money to helping the charity it is extremely appreciated. 
because like I say, we really cannot do this alone and we don't receive government funding. We're 100% reliant on donations from the public. So if you are able to, please do consider doing a fundraiser for Sarcoidosis UK. If you want to find out more about how you can do that, you can head to www.sarcoidosisuk.org forward slash support us. And we really do have something for everyone. You might be interested in running a race or or cycling, but these might also not necessarily be your thing, but we do have options for people of all abilities. Um, so please do check that out. And if fundraising just isn't your thing, that's also fine. I mean, there's lots of ways you can support the charity. And also if you're able to, on that page, there are links where you can make a donation, either a one-off donation or a regular donation. And please do remember that any funds that we put towards research are doubled by the British Lung Foundation. So any donation really does have a very big impact. Thank you so much for listening. Please do get in touch with us if there's anything that we can do to support you in relation to your sarcoidosis. We really are here to support you in any way that we can. That is what we're here to do. Now, one more thing actually before I hand you over to Jackie. You may all, everyone watching today may notice our lovely new Neurosarcoidosis Patient Day logo. This was created by one of our amazing supporters, Anna, who is very kindly volunteering her time to help us out with some new graphics for the charity. So this is one of the first things we worked on together, but we also have some really, really exciting things coming out over the next few weeks. So do keep your eyes peeled for them. You may see a sort of sneak peek of some of these as well during the breaks of the patient day. So keep an eye out for those over the coming um, weeks. Okay, thank you very much. And that's all from me for now. I will hand you back over to Jackie, who's going to talk a bit about her role in the charity. Thanks very much, Leo. Um, that's great. And I just have to add my thanks to everyone who has contributed to fundraising, supported others in their fundraising. And thanks to Charlene for keeping it all together and turning her hand to just about anything she's asked to do. So uh, uh, we're really grateful for the, the help and support that we're given by our members, because we know that not everyone is actually physically able to support us by fundraising. So, um, I I, 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 your camera's not come on for me yet. Okay, let's try that again then. Are we back? Yeah, yeah. we're back. Uh, thanks, thanks, Leo. So, well, I, I have done a few of these talks now, so I think probably um, rather than give you the whole life story of me and uh, my neurosarcoidosis. I thought I'd just let you know how I was introduced to Sarcoidosis UK. Um, there was an advert for the first meeting to be held in Scotland. It was way back in, I think it was 2012, but who knows. Uh, it was the start of my introduction anyway, and I went along to this meeting and it was, there was uh, about 20 people there and uh, I joined up straight away to the, the Facebook main group and I was um, voted on to be chairperson. Well, actually it was, it was vice chair at the time, but then the chairperson left pretty much immediately and then I was left to run the group on my own. But it has, it's given me a lot of um, uh, pleasure in being able to get people together face to face who often can't actually talk to many people about a condition that is so rare and affects them in so many odd, odd ways. So, um, yeah, we started up the Scottish group and uh, that's just gone from strength to strength. And uh, now um, Leslie Cochran and Lorna Curry help me as moderators. And we, what we do is we have um, meetings across the, the, with the Scotland and even had one in Inverness at one point, but of course they've been curtailed by COVID, so we hope to start those up again soon. Um, I was appointed a patient ambassador for the charity about seven years ago. Um, since then, we've formed more local groups across the UK, and we have another one online for partners and family who do such a great job in supporting us, but <laughs> they do need to let off steam now and again out of our earshot, so they have this group especially for them. Um, in time, we realised that the focus groups for neuro and cardiac sarcoid would be helpful for members, so added those. I'm a member of both and moderate on the neurosarcoid one. 
And if you feel that you'd like to run a local group in future, just get in touch with Leo, as he says, and uh, he'll help you out. Uh, so my days are filled with moderating and posting reliable information on all the groups and answering questions posed by members. I also get lots of private messages and some phone calls. Uh, I've been involved with research and promoting sarcoid awareness and spreading my own sarcoid story in different ways. I'll happily share my own sarcoid experiences over 47 years, uh, but it, I'm not medically trained, so I feel that any comments I make need to be justified with a link, just to let people know where I get the information from. Um, COVID, of course, had a dramatic effect on everyone's lives, and it showed it in our groups through the huge number uh, of new members joining, uh, posts relating to concerns about the risk of catching it, and the effect that it would have on triggering sarcoid, and what government support was available in the UK to avoid catching it. Then came the questions about shielding vaccines and whether they provoke a uh, sarcoid flare. The office email, phone and our, <laughs> our Facebook uh, pages were overwhelmed, so we added more moderators to help with the group. Um, all the posts on our Facebook support groups are moderated for relevancy, oh, sorry, relevancy and compliance with our rules, which can be found on our website and in About on the Facebook page. All moderators are volunteers just like me and we all have sarcoids so we can't depend on being well enough to man the Facebook support groups at all times so please do give your posts time to be approved and uh, when you do apply to join the group please answer those important questions. As part of the charity and as good practice we moderators encourage respect, sharing and reliable information and a friendly, supportive environment. Charlene Pink is our fundraising executive who seems to be able to turn her hand successfully to any situation she's required to. Again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all our fundraisers who put themselves through extreme endurance tests on our behalf and ask for donations in lieu of their special celebrations. So thank you once again. I'll hand you back now to Leo. Thank you very much, Jackie. Now, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, which is a, it was a first. So we, I think, if you're ready, Dr. Kidd, we should get moving with your talk if you're happy to. Um, it gives me real pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker, which is going to be Dr. Kidd. He is the top neurosarcoidosis specialist in the UK and a world expert on the condition. So we are so incredibly lucky to have him here with us. Um, and we're also incredibly grateful to Dr. Kidd for all of the amazing things he's done for the charity in the, in the past. I believe this is our third neurosarcoidosis patient day and Dr. Kidd's also been involved with creating the information for our website and for our leaflets as well as sitting on our patient board just to name a few things. So thank you so much for all of that Dr. Kidd and for being here today. Um, so I will hand over to you now. Let me get the slides up. Well, thank you very much, Leo and, uh, and Jackie, uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, what um, I wanted to talk about this uh, time, uh, the last couple of times we did, I did kind of lectures and things like that, uh, which I think people found uh, interesting because a lot of people don't understand the full spectrum of neurological diseases which, be, which can occur in sarcoidosis. Um, and uh, we, we've gone through that and then there are very nice um, uh, uh, information um, on all the, uh, the, the websites that Leo has mentioned as well. But I'm going to go through, just in case anyone is potentially uh, 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 disappointed that I'm not going to do that as well. As I go through treatment, uh, I'm going to uh, allude to these um, uh, different uh, features. And so hopefully everyone will gather the information that, uh, that they, they, they're hoping to, uh, to get from this. 
But treatment um, is, uh, I wanted to focus on treatment uh, for two reasons really. One is that we, uh, we understand it uh, uh, much better now. Uh, we do have uh, policies arranged which have been published and agreed on and, um, uh, and we do have, um, we're developing networks of, uh, of other inflammatory neurologists who want to learn about um, uh, the treatment of sarcoidosis as well. NHS England is involved in all of this as well and, and there are working groups that were trying to get moving again after obviously stopping last year, uh, which will help us um, regionalize uh, centers of expertise, um, which I think is going to be very helpful um, uh, as well. Um, and also then uh, uh, increase an average um, uh, high standard um, of, um, of neurological care that patients um, who've got these um, uh, neurological complications will be able to uh, receive. Um, so doctors, you know, diagnose things and they throw pills at people. And of course, the pills that we need to use for, uh, particularly for sarcoidosis, are, are complicated, uh, toxic, uh, occasionally literally poisonous. Um, and um, uh, but uh, you know, and obviously it, it helps to to get people better. But increasingly and very slowly, doctors have been um, uh, gathering together an understanding of of other aspects of uh, of what are I suppose holistic forms of uh, treatment. Um, and I'm very pleased that we're um, gathering together this information. And a lot of the, if, if you want to say that uh, the COVID catastrophe has uh, provoked benefits, well, it certainly has. You know, we, we understand uh, inflammation in the body uh, more because of the searches being done with COVID. We understand how to create uh, um, uh, very important new generation vaccines, you know, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, for example, uh, which we would never have got done uh, uh, so quickly had it not been for COVID. And the last thing is uh, to understand um, uh, why certain people get inflammatory conditions, and, and don't forget, and I'm sure everybody understands this, but COVID is not just a viral infection, it is a uh, a, a vile uh, infection which elicits an inflammatory response, uh, which has um, uh, which which has some um, uh, crossover with with how autoimmunity damages uh, uh, body tissues. Um, uh, we, we've learned that uh, things like um, uh, pre-existing diseases. Um, uh, the degree to which people are uh, physically or not physically fit, the kind of diets they've eaten prior to becoming unwell, uh, and a variety of other things uh, is extremely important. And uh, that's why I'm so thrilled that uh, Professor Brewer is talking uh, to us today, because of course he spent uh, his whole uh, academic life um, studying um, the physiology of uh, uh, fitness and, uh, and nutrition and, uh, and exercise and, and things like that. Uh, and this is going to be an increasing, uh, at least I hope it uh, becomes an increasing um, uh, part of the treatment regime uh, that hospital uh, consultants and uh, specialist nurses um, and um, uh, charity advisors will be able to pass this information on to patients, which is going to augment the, um, the medical uh, aspects of treatment um, uh, uh, in a way which allows people to improve uh, uh, and recover uh, much more quickly. So this is why I'm excited about today, because I think, you know, my, my talk is going to run through the, um, uh, the, the medical parts of things, um, and hopefully people find it interesting. But I think the main talk is going to be Professor Brewer's, which I think people uh, uh, will learn a great deal uh, from. Uh, and I think it's going to be very helpful uh, moving forward, um, uh, particularly if, for example, um, uh, Sarcoidosis UK would, uh, for, for example, agree to fund research, which is perhaps less scientific, but more actually holistic, uh, which would help us to define uh, a treatment pathway, which is going to get people better with all forms of sarcoidosis better much, much more quickly. Conceivably, it'll mean that people like me have to poison their patients less and less because they, they, uh, they don't get such severe forms of the disease. So this is what we're hoping to, to begin with, uh, with our discussions today. Uh, so the first slide, please, Leo. 
Okay, so uh, just uh, these are the main categories of, of neurological involvement by um, sarcoidosis. Um, Fifty uh, percent of people with uh, neurosarcoidosis have a, a usually straightforward uh, condition which is called cranial neuropathy. The cranial nerves are the nerves which come straight out of the brain uh, and affect predominantly uh, the, the, um, uh, the neurological structures of the head. So the first one uh, looks after um, smell, the second one looks after taste and so on. And, uh, and everybody uh, will know that one of the most common cranial neuropathies uh, is a facial neuropathy. 50% of people with uh, cranial neuropathies get facial neuropathies, which can be um, either um, uh, on one side or, or even on both. Sometimes they alternate, sometimes they repeat. Sometimes uh, they happen at the beginning of the illness. Uh, such as Herefort syndrome, for example, um, uh, and sometimes they happen um, during uh, the, uh, the illness. And happily, uh, the majority of patients uh, with cranial neuropathy don't go on to develop more um, uh, sinister and complicated forms of, um, of neurosarcoidosis. There are, of course, many exceptions. I'm just saying the majority, it would be about 70% of people uh, would not have other manifestations of, of neurosarcoidosis. But part of it, as we'll discuss in a minute, um, is um, um, uh, how skillful uh, the treating physician is at understanding uh, the underlying disease and making sure that it is suppressed by the appropriate form of treatment. Leptomeningitis refers uh, to um, uh, the worst form of, uh, of neurosarcoidosis in which um, uh, inflammation develops in the lining of the brain, which then passes directly into the brain, uh, can cause um, uh, all the, the problems that we're going to uh, discuss and the scans I'm going to show in a moment. Um, and uh, it requires very urgent treatment, as I'll mention, um, and it can affect uh, the brain, uh, the pituitary gland, uh, the brain stem, uh, the um, spinal cord, uh, and also then the nerve roots coming off the spinal cord as well. Pachymeningitis uh, is an inflammation of the dura. The dura is the fibrous um, um, shell of uh, the nervous system. Uh, uh, which uh, protects it for the obvious reasons, uh, it allows fluid to remain within it, it uh, prevents um, uh, abnormal um, uh, things like infections from getting in it, often but not always, um, and so it's a very important structure. And people with hepachymeningitis, as I'll show you in a, uh, in a moment, um, uh, can develop uh, nodules of inflammation which can press on the brain or the spinal cord and cause various problems. Headache is a particularly prominent uh, aspect of, of, of pachymeningitis. <clears throat> Vasculitis um, is increasingly uh, recognised. Uh, if I'd given uh, uh, this talk about five years ago, I would have said, well, some people say that, um, you know, strokes and hemorrhages can occur. It's not very common uh, and we don't really understand if it's related directly to sarcoidosis or not. Um, and we now uh, understand very clearly uh, that it is, uh, and I'm going to discuss this in, in detail because the, the, the treatment regime for people with uh, the leptomeningitis and the vasculitis um, uh, is extremely important. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about um, uh, another condition which uh, a lot of patients who come to see me are frustrated about, um, uh, where um, uh, they've got neurological symptoms, uh, they've got neurological signs, uh, the, the, uh, the doctors arrange uh, tests and say, well, good news, there's no sign of any problem on the, uh, on the brain scans, uh, you're obviously fine. And, um, and then they, they, their symptoms either progressively worsen and deteriorate or they wax and they wane. Um, and uh, they happily, as I will discuss, they, they do respond uh, uh, to treatment. Neuropathy is much less common. Uh, the early studies used to say that about 10% of people with neurosarcoidosis uh, get neuropathy. That's really not my experience at all. I would put it at less than 5%, uh, but I'll discuss uh, the, um, uh, the various uh, symptoms which can develop um, uh, and uh, the treatment that, uh, that I've decided is, is helpful for that form of the condition. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. Okay, 
so the um, the cartoon on the uh, right side um, is a, a, a kind of very brief um, explanation for what happens uh, whenever inflammation uh, develops, which then uh, transforms into a very particular form of inflammation, which we call granulomatous inflammation. Basically what happens in all uh, immune diseases, either autoimmune or diseases uh, caused by uh, infections such as viruses and uh, bacteria uh, and fungi, um, uh, the, the uh, memory cells of um, uh, the uh, the lymphatic system uh, recognize that there's something uh, there in the body which needs to be dealt with. Uh, it causes various changes, which is called activation of uh, white blood cells, uh, particularly T cells, but also B cells and a variety of other cells, which then lead uh, to the development of inflammation um, mediated through macrophages. Now, macrophages are um, uh, the um, uh, the um, transformed um, cells which are meant to um, uh, eat up uh, the, the foreign uh, abnormality, the virus or the, or the bacterium or, or, or the fungus. And of course in an autoimmune condition uh, there isn't anything there to eat up and so the problem is then that the macrophages then are told uh, to eat up uh, normal tissues. So the macrophages are, are the um, uh, the cells in the middle of a granuloma, they're surrounded by these lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells. Um, uh, and then these in turn then uh, spread and multiply. Um, and then if someone has a fibrotic form of the condition, and of course not everybody does, then you get um, fibrosis and other uh, problems uh, uh, leading to um, a reduction in the severity of the uh, the condition, but in others uh, you don't get fibrosis um, and the condition just worsens and worsens and worsens. So there are basically um, uh, three different forms of sarcoidosis. One would be a, a, an acute um, self-limiting uh, condition uh, which resolves either with treatment or on its own. The second would be um, a relapsing and remitting form of the condition which is often less well recognized by um, uh, by uh, 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 GPs and hospital doctors because it can sometimes come back quietly and not necessarily affect the same tissue as affected at the beginning. Um, and then the third, um, most people with neurological involvement are form this category, uh, the condition uh, uh, never goes away and it uh, worsens and deteriorates and become quite severe. So the treatments that we give uh, include um, uh, corticosteroids, uh, which remove inflammation but don't affect the disease in any way, uh, and then various um, uh, 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 suppressive medications, uh, which can influence uh, the um, uh, the way in which uh, the disease uh, acts. So steroids are very important in granulomatous disease. Those of you who've had symptoms will know that steroids tend to work very quickly uh, and they improve the symptoms noticeably, even within days. Um, uh, but the problem is that uh, as soon as the steroids come down or stop, then the condition can just come straight back again. You often have this yo-yo effect of feeling better, then feeling worse, the steroids are put up again, then you feel better, and then they're put down, so you feel worse again. Um, and it takes a long, long time for the condition uh, to settle if steroids are used on their own for uh, conditions uh, in which um, uh, immune suppression is necessary. And, and we're talking about the neurological forms. Most of the neurological forms require this. So then the immune suppression then obviously then gets at the source of the uh, immune activation. So it gets at preventing the white blood cells and the macrophages from forming the granulomatous inflammation. And they usually do that very successfully. Um, uh, azathioprine, uh, methotrexate, like a phenylate, uh, 6 mecaptopurine there are things called um, uh, calcineurin inhibitors as well, like tacrolimus and serolimus, which are quite good, but which have a lot of side effects as well. These are often, alongside steroids, uh, all that is required uh, to settle down a condition like sarcoidosis. But then others uh, do have more severe forms. And then thankfully, uh, we have again uh, access uh, to uh, treatment uh, with uh, intravenous cell therapy, such as TNF alpha blockers, of which infliximab is the main one. Um, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, again, having been stopped for us for a while in the health service, 
are, are now allowing us to, uh, to treat people with more severe forms of the condition, uh, thankfully very successfully. We do have other uh, um, uh, medications as well, which aren't uh, yet available in the uh, um, uh, the UK um, health service, but uh, have been shown to be helpful uh, in studies in other countries like France and in America, uh, which block off um, a cytokine called IL-2. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, there's another one uh, uh, um, called tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6, which has been shown to be helpful if um, uh, on the rare occasions that um, Plexamab isn't helpful. And then CD20 blockers, of which the most uh, uh, easily recognized is rituximab, um, is sometimes helpful again if um, uh, people can't take TNF-alpha blockers uh, due to allergy, for example, or uh, due to toxic effects, then we can use these other ones. But in the, in, in the National Health Service, it's more complicated nowadays to get them uh, because we don't have policies for their use in sarcoidosis. And so then it's often down uh, to going through uh, 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 several, not just one, but several uh, committees uh, allowing us to fund these kinds of uh, treatment on an individual patient basis. We're very excited about some very new drugs, uh, which are called immune checkpoint inhibitors, which have developed, been developed for cancer treatment, um, which do have anti-immune uh, effects as well. Uh, and uh, um, there has um, been a couple of uh, reports of immune checkpoint inhibitors being used um, in sarcoidosis uh, so far uh, with a beneficial effect, but obviously more work needs to be done. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So that's the, the medical part. And then the lifestyle part then, uh, well, I've kind of said this already, actually, I was meant to um, uh, keep this to this slide really, but um, you know, changes in lifestyle are very important. It's not to say that uh, people with uh, sarcoidosis have got an abnormal lifestyle. It's just that it's time, whenever your body is put under stress, um, uh, uh, with a, a disease, and of course, don't forget that the body is also put under stress with the treatment of the immune disease as well, then it's worthwhile considering uh, whether or not any changes in lifestyle uh, would be warranted. Now, this would include specific things, as we've already discussed, uh, like uh, improved fitness when it is possible uh, to do so. And of course, people with lung diseases and neurological disease often find it difficult to, you know, to do normal kind of fitness things like running and swimming and things like that. But of course, there are other ways of, of, of doing it. Uh, and then diet as well, uh, as we're going to hear later on, uh, is extremely important. But then there are other aspects of um, uh, dealing uh, with a, a chronic and complicated uh, and rare uh, condition. And that includes um, uh, understanding it uh, more. And this is where uh, this patient day comes in. And this is why the extraordinarily uh, improving uh, work that sarcoidosis is, UK is, is doing um, uh, for their patients uh, nowadays is, is coming to the fore. Um, sharing with others, understanding what the disease is, hearing how other people have gained access to treatments which have been helpful, uh, that the, the patient may not have um, uh, been uh, allowed to, uh, to understand was available. And then other um, uh, psychological factors as well, um, you know, understanding that they're not alone and, uh, and working out ways to, uh, to, to uh, ameliorate stress and, and worry uh, whenever uh, you're concerned about what effect the, uh, the disease has had on your, um, yourself, uh, your role in the family. Uh, your role in, in society as well. And, and, and these things are often overlooked by, uh, particularly by hospital uh, doctors. Thankfully, GPs understand this much better than, uh, than, than hospital doctors do. Um, but again, there are changes um, in the health service, which means that patients don't always get access to this traditional kind of uh, treatment, uh, which is so helpful as well. Uh, next slide, please, um, Leo. Okay, so I'm just going to talk then specifically about uh, the um, uh, each individual um, um, uh, category that I that I've um, uh, that I've introduced earlier on. Um, so the cranial nerves. Uh, then um, uh, there are twelve of them, uh, um, uh, two of each. Um, uh, and um, uh, they look after all of the important senses like smell and taste and vision and hearing and balance. 
uh, and how the face works and how the uh, the mouth works and how the tongue works and how swallowing occurs and uh, all of these things. Cranial neuropathy, as I've mentioned already, um, uh, affects 50% of all cases of patients with neurological involvement in sarcoid. Uh, and by the way, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, 5% um, uh, of all people with sarcoidosis get neurological involvement. So 50% of those 5% get cranial neuropathies. 50% of those, 50% of the 5% get facial neuropathies, um, but any other cranial nerve can be affected either on its own or in a combination. Um, the, the two slides I've shown, obviously these are brain scans. The one on the top, uh, you, uh, uh, you may be able to see uh, that um, in the middle, there is a kind of a, a not a very, it's a sort of trapezoid kind of bump in the brain. This is the brain stem. Can you see on the, on the right-hand side of the picture, which is the left-hand side of the, the person's brain, uh, there's a bright area. This is a, a nerve, which is the facial nerve, which um, comes out of that area and goes through the uh, base of the skull uh, um, uh, and then into the face where it uh, divides up into lots of different branches, which uh, allow you to move the face on each side and uh, allow you to make facial expressions and talk and all sorts of important things. Uh, the one at the bottom uh, is the optic nerve and you can see that again on the right side of the picture but the left uh, the eye of the patient uh, there is that bright area uh, which is the optic nerve uh, in between the two bright muscles that you can see. Uh, the bright area is the abnormal area uh, and a, a patient such as this would have diminishment of, of uh, vision uh, which uh, thankfully does respond well uh, to, uh, to treatment. So the treatment of, of patients with cranial neuropathy uh, basically involves um, uh, how severe it is uh, and whether or not it's a single event uh, and whether or not it is associated with other uh, systemic manifestations. So it's very common, as I've said already, for you to get a facial neuropathy at the beginning of the disease or very quickly into the beginning of the disease within the first uh, couple of months, for example. It can also uh, occur um, whenever the disease having been settled then starts to come back again. Uh, and so we normally um, uh, treat it with steroids uh, on its own if it's the beginning, whilst the respiratory uh, people are, are uh, diagnosing the disorder um, and uh, defining its, how widespread it is and how severe it is. And then uh, it, it's okay then uh, to give people steroids and then to watch them carefully. And then if the facial neuropathy or the other neuropathy gets better, then um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the other doctors then who look after lungs and livers and skin and eyes and everything else, uh, then can define the, the treatment. And if everything settles down uh, and the sarcoid goes away, then uh, hooray for that. And, and patients don't need to have any other uh, treatment, but if the, the condition uh, worsens despite the steroid treatment, then we need to move on uh, to uh, um, other forms of, uh, of treatment, including suppressing the uh, immune system. So that's what I mean by uh, restaging uh, the disease and either escalating or recommencing uh, uh, treatment. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So leptomeningitis is a completely different um, uh, ball game, as they say in America. Um, uh, leptomeningitis means uh, that the inner lining of the brain has been affected. Uh, it is a meningitis, uh, not the kind of meningitis that babies get, uh, because that's a bacterial form of meningitis, uh, but it's a meningitis uh, which spreads into the, the brain. And, and as you can see with the two MRI scans there, uh, again, um, the bright areas are the abnormal areas. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, in each case, these are two different people, um, uh, there are um, areas on the surface of the brain which are bright, which are not present at the top of the brain, as you can see, nor on the right side of the picture. Uh, but, and then you can see uh, that uh, it spreads in uh, along what are called perivascular spaces. And you can see uh, on the, um, the lower of the two pictures, 
um, uh, it spreads in almost into the middle of the, uh, the brain where the ventricles are. Uh, and then in the lower part of that picture, this is the area of the brain known as the cerebellum. It's actually much more severe. The brightness is greater. And in fact, it actually spreads right in uh, to where the, uh, the ventricle is. And you can see actually some brightness there. Uh, and it even uh, spreads to the other side. On the upper picture, it's rather similar. Uh, again, you can see that it's on the surface of the brain. There is a nodule in the middle of it. I'm sure everyone can see that circular area, which is brighter than, uh, than everywhere else. And then it settles back down into the normal gray structures of the brain. But then you can see that there are these um, uh, uh, areas um, uh, adjacent to blood vessels which are brighter right the way through, which leads then to another nodule on the inside of the brain on that side. It's the right side of the brain, but the left side of the scan, uh, where in which it is um, um, uh, brighter again uh, on the surface of the inside of the, of the brain. So this is much more serious. Uh, patients get um, a headache, they get drowsing, they get what are called spreading neurological signs, so it rather depends in, in, in uh, uh, patients such as I've shown you with these scans, they would have numbness and weakness, they might have seizures, uh, they definitely get a drowsiness and a difficulty with, uh, with cognitive processing. The condition known as hydrocephalus um, uh, involves the de development of pressure within the brain, which can be very severe and require urgent um, uh, treatment. So this is an emergency. Um, and uh, it can happen at the beginning of the disease. Uh, and so neurologists can sometimes have to diagnose the condition or it can happen um, uh, after the disease has been diagnosed um, uh, already uh, with respiratory or um, uh, liver symptoms, for example. Intravenous steroids are uh, extremely important. They need to be followed by high dose um, uh, steroid tablets then because the low dose would not clear this in any way. And you have to start suppressing the immune system um, um, straight away. It's not going to settle down just with steroids and its own. Uh, we sometimes use intravenous um, uh, suppression uh, with chemotherapy, uh, but nowadays it would be much better uh, using infliximab because the chemotherapy usually just um, uh, uh, delays things, improves things for a while, uh, but the condition can come back again, whereas infliximab treats it properly uh, and clears uh, the, the treatment um, uh, hopefully uh, forever, uh, although it does take um, uh, two or three years uh, before we can start to reduce down uh, the treatment. But if we use um, high-dose uh, oral immune suppression with infliximab, it means that the patient needs uh, to expose themselves to much lower doses of steroids uh, in the long term. And this obviously has very important effects uh, preventing uh, putting on weight, preventing uh, the development of diabetes, preventing a, 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 um, a change in their uh, appearance, uh, the development of blood pressure, uh, the development of osteoporosis, and all of these other uh, you know, dreadful complications of, of steroids. But the steroids, you see, are essential, as I mentioned already, uh, and so we have to use them. But if we can limit them by gaining uh, access uh, to alternative treatments which have fewer side effects, uh, then it's a much safer uh, a way of uh, treating the patients. Next slide, please, Leo. So this is this Paki meningitis that I, I have mentioned. You can see on the scans that it's, it's the lining of the brain. The brain is much less affected. So the, the brain itself doesn't get inflamed, but it gets squashed by the inflammation which develops um, in the, um, uh, the lining of the, the brain. And you can see the two main brain scans uh, show it. There's, the top one is at the back of the brain where it pushes the brain forward. Uh, and uh, you, 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 people like me can see that, um, uh, that the, uh, the left side of the brain, but the right side of the picture, um, the, the other parts of the brain are slightly squashed. Uh, compared with the, uh, the, the side of the brain on the left side. Uh, the lower picture, uh, the brain isn't squashed at all, thank goodness, uh, but you can see that uh, the inflammation uh, is right the way around 
uh, both sides it goes in and then it comes out and then it goes round to the other side and so that patient presented with headache but without any other symptoms the headache didn't go away until we treated the, uh, the condition and then the uh, the scan on the um, uh, the right then is obviously a spinal cord and about halfway down you can see uh, that there is an inflammation of the dura pressing onto the spinal cord causing problems with um, uh, bladder function uh, weakness of the legs and numbness of the legs as well uh, so it tends to be more indolent, it tends to be quieter in onset, it's often been there probably for many, many months before it's even recognised. Headache is the predominant symptoms. Uh, you can get focal neurological signs depending on where uh, the disorder arises. Seizures are occasional, but hydrocephalus and this kind of destruction of the brain uh, that happens with leptomeningitis tends not to occur. Steroids work well, but um, uh, it would take it takes years for it all to settle. You just can't use steroids on their own. Uh, you would have to use very, very high doses for a long, long, long time uh, for it to settle down. So immune suppression needs to be started straight away. Uh, infliximab uh, is helpful for this condition, um, but um, it's not essential. Most people do settle down uh, with uh, uh, tablets on their own. Methotrexate in particular is good for this kind of condition. I use infliximab. Um, if there is uh, no response uh, to uh, the condition, um, if it is particularly severe, or if there is only a very slow response, or if it tends to relapse as we reduce the steroids down despite maximal um, uh, immune suppression. But it can take over five years uh, before apache meningitis resolves in entirety. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So this is the kind of the new subcategory, um, uh, really, um, uh, vasculitis. Um, um, uh, I think I'm seeing it more and more only because it's being um, understood uh, more and more. Uh, this, uh, MRI scans are showing things up in much greater detail. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it we're understanding it uh, more and so we're understanding the treatment of it more as well. So I thought I'd explain the uh, the four um, uh, pictures that I, I've shown. If we start on the, the top right hand corner, uh, this is just a regular kind of um, stroke uh, of the part of the brain known as the cerebellum uh, and that's due to a blockage of uh, a blood vessel in exactly the same way as any other stroke would occur in people who've got cholesterol problems or diabetes or who smoke cigarettes or who have uh, long-standing high blood pressure for example. It doesn't look any different on, on, the, uh, on that scan uh, as it would uh, to anyone uh, else but this person had the stroke uh, despite uh, being young having normal blood pressure, never having smoked a cigarette in his life, uh, and not having any family history or cholesterol problems or anything like that. Uh, the one below that then is a brain uh, uh, hemorrhage. Uh, it um, uh, uh, occurs uh, whenever the blood vessels are inflamed and um, it's it, although you can get what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage which is very uncommon which can be more severe uh, these um, uh, hemorrhages tend to be small uh, they tend to occur in the cerebellum or in the frontal region we call them intraparenchymal uh, hemorrhages uh, and they occur not because um, a blood vessel bursts in the way that other brain hemorrhages can occur, which is obviously very serious. Uh, but uh, whenever um, uh, the uh, small blood vessels under low pressure um, uh, leak uh, blood uh, and the, the um, uh, the next, um, uh, sorry, not the next slide, Leo, but the next uh, uh, slide on the left of the um, um, uh, the scan that I'm referring to with the big arrow on it, um, this is a, a biopsy specimen where you can actually see a blood vessel. The blood vessel is the bit surrounded by the kind of greeny browny um, uh, coloured cells. Uh, there's then blood inside, uh, but then the integrity of the blood vessel wall has been breached by the inflammation coming in uh, from the um, uh, the um, uh, the granulomatous inflammation from the uh, lining of the brain, um, and so then a little bit of blood leaks out um, and causes the the hemorrhage. It causes some unpleasant symptoms, often as a sudden headache, and you would get um, uh, uh, symptoms um, uh, of whatever part of the brain the the, um, the hemorrhage occurs in. 
You get other symptoms as well. You can get TIAs uh, and they can be stuttering as well. So the TIAs uh, can come. A TIA obviously is something which we get a neurological impairment, loss of vision, uh, numbness down one side, weakness down one side, difficulty talking, all of these kinds of things which can occur and then go away and then can occur and then go away, but they can increase and increase and increase. And crucially, um, uh, uh, Whenever people have um, TIAs due to uh, uh, blood pressure or smoking, for example, we, we give an aspirin tablet and, and the aspirin usually settles things down. Aspirin doesn't work for uh, TIAs due to sarcoidosis because there's nothing wrong with the blood flow. It's all to do with the fact that the blood vessel is inflamed. So the last brain scan uh, on the, and the biggest brain scan on this slide uh, shows this. Um, uh, and you can see uh, that there is inflammation on both sides of the brain. It's, this is a particularly severe example. But if you look uh, in the middle of the scan, you can see those kind of little sort of wavy um, uh, lines. These are blood vessels extending from the surface of the brain inside. Uh, they're on both sides. It's less on the right side of the um, uh, slide uh, than on the left, as you can see, uh, but it affects um, uh, both sides. And there's also inflammation on the lining of the brain, as you can see uh, on, uh, on both sides. And so this is inflammation of blood vessels. Um, and uh, we have seen this uh, on occasions in people, you know, in the olden days who've ended up having autopsies because the doctors weren't sure what uh, was wrong with them before they died. Um, uh, so we have seen that this occurs, but we've only recently been able to start seeing it uh, whenever we've looked for it um, in, um, uh, in the up-to-date modern MRI scans uh, at high field strength. So uh, this can occur um, uh, on its own. Uh, or with a leptomeningitis. So not everybody who has strokes has the, uh, the kind of picture that I'm showing with the largest of the four um, uh, pictures that I, I've shown there. Um, and sometimes the brain looks absolutely normal, uh, uh, only that the stroke or the hemorrhage is there. Uh, and that is because the blood, only the blood vessels are involved and you don't get a meningitis alongside it. Uh, my feeling is that, uh, that this is um, uh, as severe as a leptomeningitis uh, is, and then it should be treated as aggressively um, uh, as um, a leptomeningitis is. So that would be with high dose steroids intravenous at the beginning and then oral tablets after that, immediate uh, institutional treatment with immune suppression uh, drugs, and then probably also infliximab as well. And so far this year, I've treated three people under these circumstances with infliximab and happily they've responded very nicely. So I think think that is going to be the right form of treatment uh, for this particular subtype of the, uh, the condition. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. Ha, huh. okay. <laughs> my neurologist says I can't have neurosarcoidosis because my scans are normal. I'm hoping people are smiling at this. I see a lot of people who are, have this um, um, story. But let me tell you that uh, there are two things, really. Um, uh, not everybody with neurosarcoidosis has an abnormal brain scan, particularly um, if a, the condition relapses after a treatment. So the brain scan can be normal uh, at the beginning and remain normal, or it can deteriorate and become normal, or it can be abnormal at the beginning and then settle down with treatment. But then as a relapse occurs, it, it doesn't necessarily become abnormal again. This is particularly uh, common in people with spinal cord disease uh, and with cranial neuropathies. And as I mentioned at the beginning, 50% uh, of those with cranial neuropathies um, uh, may have normal scans, but actually whenever you look at the spinal fluid, you can see that there is inflammation within the spinal fluid. Similarly, uh, with spinal cord uh, disease uh, as well. And particularly, there's a particular subtype of spinal cord disease in which it doesn't develop as a sudden thing, like a myelitis, for example, uh, where it's rather obvious that something bad has developed. It can quietly and gradually uh, uh, develop and deteriorate, um, uh, and it doesn't necessarily um, show up uh, any abnormalities on the scan. Um, and this is a worrying uh, uh, aspect to this, uh, particularly if contrast isn't uh, given, then uh, some people who've got a mixture of what we call upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs in whom other symptoms like sensory symptoms uh, don't necessarily develop, you can develop a condition which looks exactly like uh, 
uh, a motor neuron disease, um, or ALS as they call it in America, uh, well, we call it that here too. Um, uh, and then it's possible that patients with sarcoidosis uh, can be misdiagnosed with motor neuron disease and wouldn't therefore be able to gain access to treatment which would um, uh, improve or at the very least prevent it from progressively deteriorating uh, and leading uh, to death, for example. There's another uh, uh, condition which is exceedingly uncommon. I've only seen it four or five times, but it's, it, it's terribly interesting um, uh, in, in which you develop a progressively worsening uh, encephalopathy. So that's drowsiness, um, uh, neurological symptoms, which often vary, uh, loss of speech one day, and then sensory disturbances another, and then weakness, which then gets better on its own, and seizures which occur, which then settle down. Nothing shows up on the brain scan. Uh, I've uh, um, seen three people in whom we've actually uh, had to um, uh, do um, uh, uh, brain biopsies uh, because we haven't been able to diagnose the condition uh, through other means uh, in whom uh, there are very florid um, signs of sarcoidosis uh, in the brain which don't show up on, on brain scans. And these people um, um, uh, improve very well with, uh, with, with treatment. Uh, I've had people uh, with seizures who have been unconscious, for example, who are now walking around, talking, feeling much, much better uh, with hardly any residual um, symptoms um, uh, in, in whom uh, we've had to give a lot of treatment to get them better. So these uh, uh, more mild cases uh, can occur uh, uh, as well, um, and um, uh, and people who've got neurological symptoms and signs, um, if um, uh, the scans are normal, then it's usually worthwhile looking at the spinal fluid as well. We often get clues that there is uh, uh, a sign of inflammation there, uh, and then uh, people uh, with the more mild forms of the condition, uh, involving the spinal cord, for example, or involving the, uh, the brain, um, uh, then if we restage the disease and then escalate or reintroduce treatment, patients usually respond to it quite nicely. I think there's one more slide, uh, Leo, about uh, neuropathy. Four minutes to talk about neuropathy. Um, so uh, neuropathy is not uh, common, as I've uh, mentioned as well. There are various different types which have been attributed to sarcoidosis. We don't always see abnormalities compatible with sarcoidosis um, if we do a nerve biopsy, for example, but all of these different types can occur. So uh, a large fibre sensory neuropathy is, is numbness of the hands and the feet, which spreads up the legs. A large fibre sensory motor neuropathy does the same thing, but often causes some weakness of the toes and sometimes of the, of the fingers leading to loss of dexterity. Neither becomes particularly severe um, and it's usually not a big deal or a worsening kind of problem for the majority of cases. Mononeuritis occurs as well. It can be multiplex, which means uh, lots of different nerves can be affected or it can be single. So you can get uh, a wrist drop, for example, or weakness of the, uh, of the uh, uh, hand muscles or difficulty with lifting the, uh, the um, the foot up, for example, a foot drop as well. These things usually settle uh, quite nicely uh, just with, uh, with um, steroid treatment. Uh, again, we restage the disease. Uh, and if we feel that the, uh, the underlying disease is, um, uh, is inadequately treated, then we either add in um, uh, an immune suppressive agent or we increase the strength of it or we use a stronger one, or we make an adjustment to the steroids. And the symptoms usually um, settle down. They don't always improve, but they usually stop getting worse. Small fibre neuropathy is an under-recognised uh, uh, condition. A lot of people get very uh, painful, burning feelings in, their, in their, uh, the soles of their feet and the tips of their fingers. And without treatment, that can worsen. Uh, about 50% of people have additional problems as well with autonomic symptoms, uh, either with, uh, with easy uh, fainting um, uh, uh, spells or lightheadedness whenever you stand up, or difficulty with digestion as well as slowing down of the colon, or a difficulty with emptying uh, the stomach as well. And these symptoms are often very poorly recognized, particularly by uh, uh, neurologists. Uh, but they again can be um, uh, stabilized 
uh, with treatment. We, we can't always get them better, uh, but we certainly can uh, prevent them from getting worse. Small fibre neuropathy with pain, uh, we can of course treat with, um, with anti-neuropathic agents, um, uh, often uh, epileptic or migraineous kind of drugs, uh, which, which uh, help the symptoms as well. So that's a run uh, through the main uh, categories and the kind of treatments that we give and, and the reasons why we give certain treatments to um, uh, some people and not to others. It all depends on the severity and on what we think uh, uh, the patients will respond to. Uh, we then try uh, escalating the treatment. If that doesn't work or if we don't feel there's a, a, an adequate response, then we'll escalate further. We may add in other, uh, other drugs. And so that's how we uh, treat uh, the, the symptoms of, um, of neurosarcoidosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kidd, for that very interesting talk on neurosarcoidosis treatment and management. We are now going to have a quick 10 minute break. So we will see you all back at 20 past three for another great talk from Professor John Brewer, who will be talking about the role of exercise and nutrition in the management and control of sarcoidosis, which I'm really looking forward to. So we'll see you back here at 20 past three.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the 2021 Neurosarcoidosis Patient Day. I'm really pleased to be able to announce our next speaker is Professor John Brewer, who will be talking to us about the role of exercise and nutrition in the management and control of sarcoidosis. Hello everyone and welcome back to now, the 2021 Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this is a topic that we get a lot of questions coming into the office about, so we really do have the best person to be talking to us about this today. Professor Brewer is a professor of sport and exercise science, and he really has worked at the highest level with lots of top athletes, um, as well as writing papers and authoring books on the topic as well. So thank you very much for, here, for being here, Professor Brewer. I will hand over to you and get your slides off. Thanks, Leo. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great. Pleasure to be with you today, this afternoon. I know there are people from all over the world who are joining us, so I uh, try and avoid uh, talking about this afternoon too much. Um, yeah, Leo has, has said my background's in sport and exercise science. I've been very lucky over the years. Um, my first job, for those of you that are following the European Soccer Championships at the moment, was as head of human performance for the English Football Association. And very soon after starting, I found myself as the fitness coach for the England team at Italia 90, where England progressed to the semi-finals of the World Cup, quite an iconic tournament. And thereafter, I've been very fortunate to have worked with many top sports people, advising them on their exercise, advising them on diet, and at the same time, conducting research into the area of sports science. And my, my particular interest is really in the application of sports science and sports nutrition to performance. I love doing stuff that, I, I can genuinely talk to people about that can help them improve their lives, improve their performance, improve their, their health and well-being. So it really is a great pleasure to be invited to talk to you this afternoon uh, about a topic that I really love and, and around, I think in a sense of passion uh, about how exercise can be used not just with people with sarcoidosis, but for all people as a, perform, as a form of prevention, uh, of, of illness occurring, but also as a form of, of treatment to help people live healthier and more active lives, regardless uh, of, of what condition they may have or what their background might be. So um, I'm going to talk sort of for half an hour, 40 minutes or so, looking forward to the panel discussion later, looking forward to taking any questions that you may have, uh, and hopefully trying to impart a few ideas and a few thoughts that will help those of you with psycho psychodosis or those of you who are looking after people with psychodosis to realise that, as Dr. Kidd said, uh, lifestyle change, lifestyle management, behavioural change really can have an impact on your way of life. And it's a great way of, in a sense, getting back to normal and showing that you can stand up to psychodosis and um, get on top of it and really control the way in which you live your life. Um, so, Leo, if I could just have the next slide, please. Um, my current role actually isn't in academia. I'm the chief executive of a large uh, global educational charity, which I thoroughly enjoy doing. We're helping to transform the lives of young people uh, who can get access to UK universities. But at the same time, I'm also um, a visiting professor at the University of Suffolk and have been fortunate to have worked with the team at the University of Kingston in London uh, and been encouraging them to do some specific research into sarcoidosis and exercise. And what we've done uh, is to conduct a review study of all of the scientific literature that currently exists relating to sarcoidosis and exercise. And I really want to thank the team at Kingston, Dr. Hannah Moore and her colleagues, Dr. Swan, Dr. Morton Holmes, for all of their hard work. We currently have a manuscript that's been submitted for review into an academic journal. And I'm very hopeful that that uh, manuscript will be published as a paper and we'll be able to share the findings again which are very practical uh, to you and to other people with an interest in sarcoidosis. So really for the first time today I wanted to present the headline findings and they genuine, genuinely are the headlines. There's some of the key things that we found, some of which, many of which in fact, probably won't be a surprise to you but what I then try to do is to take those findings and translate them into some practical advice and some practical thoughts on how we can incorporate exercise and healthy nutrition into lifestyles to help in the treatment, management and control of sarcoidosis. Uh, so I'd have the next slide, please, Leo. So what I'm going to do to start with is to focus very much on the research that we've conducted. Uh, I'll talk about exercise and sarcoidosis, but I'll also kick off with a little bit of a, a description, a background into what happens to the body 
when we exercise because my former professor when I was at Loughborough was always very keen to instill into me the need to understand the mechanisms and whilst I'm not going to go um, you'd be pleased to know into a, a detailed physiological talk this afternoon I will give you an overview of how the body uh, operates when we exercise and that I think then gives us a better understanding of how we can use exercise to combat uh, many of the symptoms of sarcoidosis. Um, I'm then going to talk about nutrition and sarcoidosis and, and hands up there hasn't been a great deal of research in this area. I know we'll be talking about future areas for research and, and what we want to do going forward later on today. Uh, what I've done is taken my knowledge of nutrition and applied that to sarcoidosis uh, and I think we've done pretty well today. We're about an hour and a half into the session and I don't think anybody has yet mentioned uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'm, I think, the first to do so. Uh, I thought it was only right today to just try and um, blend some of what I'm talking about regarding exercise and nutrition into COVID-19, helping to protect the body against COVID-19, particularly uh, if you have sarcoidosis. So Leo, if I could just go on to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that I always say to students and to people who I'm talking to is that our bodies are designed to exercise. Uh, it's very easy to forget that our ancestors many thousands of years ago had to exercise to get their food. They had to run to catch prey, they had to walk to gather in crops. Exercise was a fundamental part of their lifestyles. Indeed, they often had to run even faster than their prey if they wished to avoid being the, the food of the prey. So we have evolved physiologically as human beings for whom exercise is, is fundamental to what we are and what we do. I think unfortunately, lifestyles have intervened and for many people, exercise has no longer become a fundamental part of our lives. We see the advent of computers, of cars, of transport systems, even remote control buttons that mean that we don't even have to stand up to change the television channel anymore, have really taken exercise out of our lives. So as a global nation, uh, we do far less, less exercise than we ever used to. And of course, if you don't exercise and you have a condition such as sarcoidosis, then as I'll say a little bit later on, that can really compound things and, and make things even worse. So if we just move on to the next slide, Leo, I've got two or three slides where I'm just going to talk in very basic terms about what happens to the body when we exercise. So sitting here as we are today, listening to the talks, we'll be breathing, probably taking 10 or 12 breaths a minute and probably 12 to 15 litres of air going into our lungs. Of that air, about one fifth, 20.9% is oxygen. And it's that oxygen that is absolutely critical to the functioning of the body because within the lungs, and the lungs subdivide into, into a myriad of, of much finer channels. And right at the very end, there are little air sacs that we call alveoli. And within those air sacs, the oxygen that's in the air diffuses across the very thin membrane of that air sac into the blood, but more specifically into the haemoglobin in the blood, which is the oxygen carrying component of the blood, then that blood is pumped around the body by the heart. Uh, and when I talk to people about exercise, and you often say, well, you know, what's the most important muscle to develop? Is it my abs? Is it my calves? Is it my, my quads? Is it my, my pecs, my shoulders and so on? Actually, the most important muscle in the body is the heart, because without a good and healthy heart, uh, it's very difficult to perform exercise effectively and, and to function properly. The lungs are a critical organ because we need to have the lungs in good shape to get that air into the lungs, to get oxygen from the alveoli into the bloodstream. And then the pump, which is the heart, is pumping that oxygen uh, around the body. And we see some phenomenal changes in, in the body when we exercise. Heartbeat at rest, probably around 60 or 70 beats per minute can get close to 200, even 220 beats a minute when we exercise. The ventilation rate, the amount of air, of air that goes into the lungs, as I said just now, 10, 15 litres of air per minute at rest, anything up to 100 to 150 litres of air, even in some top athletes, close to 200 litres liters of air per minute going in and out of, of the lungs. And if you think about how long it takes you to put 50 litres of fuel into your car, and you think that the lungs can take in and out 100, 100, 100 to 150 litres of air per minute, that just shows you um, the, how incredibly powerful the lungs are. And even the heart, when it's beating maximally, can beat about 30 litres of blood around the body per minute. 
So our organs, the heart, the lungs really are designed to exercise and have the capacity to exercise at a very high level. Now, when we take oxygen into the bloodstream, we transport it around the body predominantly to the muscles, where it combines with the fuel, the energy in the muscles, particularly carbohydrate and particularly fat, to help us to exercise. Now, again, at the moment, sitting around at rest, we're probably using about three millilitres, three mils of oxygen for every kilogram of body weight that you weigh. Uh, I was watching Samo Farah last night run 10 kilometres in about 27 minutes and 40 seconds, just a bit too slow for him, sadly, to qualify for the Olympics. He has the capacity when he's exercising to transport something in the region of 80 millilitres of oxygen per kilogram of body weight to his muscles. So you have a range, a continuum of between about three at rest up to about 80 millilitres of oxygen per kilo of body weight per minute for top athletes. We all sit somewhere on that continuum and when you move from sitting to standing to walking you will use more oxygen. Your ability to do exercise depends on how much oxygen you can get through that transport system to the muscles and really in order to function effectively and I'll come on and talk about this a little bit later on you probably need to be transporting 15 to 20 millilitres of oxygen per kilogram of body weight to your muscles in order to stand up, walk around the house, walk to, to catch the bus, push the lawnmower around the garden. That's the sort of value that you need to have a reasonably active lifestyle. The moment your value starts to drop and gets closer to 10 or below single figures, then the ability to function effectively and have a good lifestyle does tend to decrease quite significantly. So the heart pumps the blood full of oxygen around the body. Uh, you can see looking downwards from top to bottom, the big red vertical artery that's pumping blood rich with oxygen around the body. Next to it is a blue vein. That signifies blood that's used or given up its oxygen to the muscles, being pumped again by the heart back into the lungs where it reloads up with oxygen to start that journey again. And that really is the cardiovascular system, the system that gives the body the energy that it needs through the supply of oxygen to take part in exercise. Next slide, please, Leo. But of course, in order to make the muscles work, to make us function effectively, as Dr. Kidd has spoken so eloquently about earlier today, we have to have a neural pathway, a nerve system that helps us to do that. And so there are nerves running from the brain down the spinal cord to the muscles that combine with that energy production process to help us to function, to help us stand, to move, to talk, to help with all the functions that the body needs to stay healthy and active. So that nervous system is critical because without the nervous system, even if there is a supply of healthy blood with oxygen in it and a good supply of fuel in terms of carbohydrate and fat, then without the nervous system, we can't perform as well as we should do. Next slide, please, Leo. And ultimately, movement is all about the movement of our muscles. Normally the contraction or shortening of a muscle, muscles will be attached to, uh, to, the, to the bones through tendons and, and ligaments. Uh, that contraction of the muscle will then stimulate movement. So we've got the muscles that are getting a supply of oxygen. They've already got a supply of, of fuel, the, the carbohydrate and the fat. And then with the nerves as well, that's how we function and that's how we move. So that's what our body is very much designed to do. And we know that with muscles, for example, if we stimulate them and they do exercise, we can get the muscle size to increase. The muscle fibers get bigger through the laying down of protein within the muscle fiber. That makes the muscle bigger and stronger. But also, uh, if the muscles don't do a great deal of exercise, they what we call atrophy, they lose protein, they get smaller and they lose strength. And one of the things that I've seen over and over again over the years is that the body is a very elastic system, elastic in the sense that it will grow and develop and respond and improve to the stimulus of training, which is absolutely fantastic. We can see how training at whatever level you start or exercise at whatever level you start can help you improve, and get greater muscle mass, improve your oxygen carrying capacity, improve your physical function. We know that exercise will stimulate that, but at the same time, if you stop, you reduce the amount that you do, 
then unfortunately everything regresses and the body gets worse and worse. So you can't store up the fitness and the, and the health that you gain from an exercise program and hope that it's there for, for ad infinitum. And unfortunately, as we all know, it isn't. So that's really a brief overview of exercise. And I would stress that it is a very brief overview and I've probably just encapsulated at least one or two terms of first year um, physiology classes into three slides, but it just gives you a, a, an overview of feeling for the mechanisms that are involved when we do exercise. So if I have the next slide, please, Leo. Um, what I now want to do is to start to focus a little bit on the findings of the research that we conducted with the team at the University of Kingston. And we reviewed almost 2000 people with sarcoidosis. And we found that of, the, those, of those 2000, the vast majority have unfortunately reduced physical activity. And whilst we know that many people's physical activity reduces with age as they get older, the rate at which people with sarcoidosis decreased their physical activity was even greater. So we were seeing people with sarcoidosis doing even less exercise than we would have expected compared to non-sarcoidosis patients of the same age. Uh, we also saw that people with sarcoidosis have reduced muscle strength. The, the muscles have, have atrophied, as I said, the strength of the muscle has decreased um, as a result, again, of a lack of exercise. And th that happened at a greater rate than we would have expected with age. We, there is a, a condition called sarcopenia, which is, in, in a sense, a natural uh, decrease in muscle strength as people age. We saw even greater sarcopenia with people with sarcoidosis. Those combined um, meant that we saw with a much reduced exercise capacity uh, in people with sarcoidosis compared to non-sarcoidosis patients. Not surprisingly, they had deconditioned and uh, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, they had higher levels of fatigue as well. So higher levels of fatigue despite doing less exercise. Now, in a sense, many of these, these things are not a, not a great surprise, but it was uh, really for us to quantify that. And, and we were, I suppose, in a sense, disappointed that what we had suspected to be the case actually had was proven to be the case. Much more deconditioning, greater uh, fatigue, much uh, reduced physical activity and reduced exercise capacity in sarcoidosis patients. Back into the next slide please, Leo. Something that uh, Dr. Kidd alluded to is, is really what, what comes first. Is it a lack of physical exercise just because people have sarcoidosis that causes the, the decrease in fitness? Or is it the sarcoidosis itself that is causing uh, that, that decrease in fitness? And it's a very difficult one at the moment to untangle. We're not quite sure what, what has come first. But if I could just move on to the next slide, please, Leo. Um, the really good news that we found in the studies which had looked at people with sarcoidosis and then placed them on exercise programs was that we found that all of the areas where we had seen large decreases actually improved. And that's really good news. It's, it's a really positive finding. So going back to my slide four or five slides ago, that oxygen transport capacity was significantly improved in people with sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis who exercised. We saw that sarcoidosis patients could increase their muscle strength. There was no barrier to increase muscle strength. Combined, that increased exercise capacity. And really importantly, despite the fact that they were doing more exercise, reduced levels of general fatigue. That malaise, that sarcoidosis fatigue that I'm sure many of you are aware of, decreased to a large extent with exercise. And really importantly, improved quality of life getting back control of your life as a result of exercise. So we saw through our, our assessment of all of these studies that exercise really was able to fight back against sarcoidosis and that there is no barrier to the improvements in physiological capacity that we see in non-sarcoidosis patients in sarcoidosis patients. You can still get the same improvements as anybody else. And I think that for us was a really positive finding from the research that we, uh, that we conducted. Um, if I move on to the next slide, please, Leo. Um, I've talked about exercise, obviously, uh, and one question that I've probably been asked more and more times over the last 30 or 40 years is, is what type of exercise is good for me? 
Now, my response to that is, 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 on, is on a number of levels. Firstly, there is really no bad form of exercise. Secondly, it really will depend on you as an individual. And I'll come back and talk about that over the next two or three slides. The type of exercise that works for one person may not be the right type of exercise for somebody else. So I'm not going to sit here today and, and speak specifically about a particular type of exercise that may be beneficial. We can perhaps touch a little bit more on di different types of exercise later on uh, this afternoon. But for me, there is no bad type of exercise. It's an exercise that is right for you. And most importantly, it should be exercise that is enjoyable, something that you enjoy doing, something that you're happy doing, something that fits in with your lifestyle. And bear in mind as well that whilst exercise at a high intensity, which I'll talk about again in a second or two, um, might need to be quite high if you're already physically fit, if you're somebody who has done little or no exercise, then even walking, walking around the garden, walking to the shops is a great form of exercise for you. So there's no wrong type of exercise. It needs to be enjoyable. I think over the recent times, we've seen group exercise becoming more and more popular. And I would certainly encourage you, um, even within your sarcoidosis groups that I know Jackie was talking about earlier, to see whether group exercise for sarcoidosis patients really does work because exercising together is incredibly motivational. You keep each other going. Um, and we've seen with all the growth of exercise classes and online exercise classes, particularly in the last 15 months, that that type of exercise is really beneficial. And, and I would always advocate um, exercising with a friend, with a partner, uh, is also a great way of, of keeping yourself uh, going with your exercise because we don't want people to start and then stop because they're getting bored, they're getting fed up, or they're finding the exercise uh, that isn't really right for them. Next slide, please, Leo. Next question I, I'm often asked is how tough, how hard should exercise be? And I'm afraid there is a, a category of thinking that says that exercise that isn't painful isn't good for you. That's total and, and utter nonsense. And I'll go back to my, my former professor at, at Loughborough who used two words that I still repeat today, and that is that exercise, which is good for you, should be at a level which is of tolerable discomfort. That is not exercise where you are in pain, where you're sweating buckets, where you're finding it really tough, nor should it be exercise where you're hardly giving any exertion. Something that you can just about cope with, hold a conversation, isn't really giving you any pain, uh, is a great way of, of exercising. That's about the right sort of intensity of exercise. And certainly no pain, no gain, which is an adage that I'm afraid has been bounced around by many fitness trainers in the past, is not one that I would subscribe to. Um, so tolerable discomfort. And if anything, looking at that slide, turning the dial more towards the left than the right is a way of getting the exercise inten intensity at a level that will still be doing you good, but not causing you pain and discomfort to a level which will make you think twice about going out and exercising again uh, on another occasion. Next slide, please, Leo. How long should exercise last? Well, again, I'm afraid there is no simple answer to that because for me, if we set guidelines, and, and I'm very aware that um, in the media, there are guidelines around exercising for 20 or 30 minutes a day and so on, my view on that has always been that if you set a specific time and you don't achieve that, you'll almost feel as if not achieving that time uh, means that the exercise hasn't been good enough. That's absolute nonsense. For me, even exercising for two or three minutes, if you've not exercised before, is a massive breakthrough. And I know we've had one of our psychodosis patients in the UK um, who's raised a huge amount of money um, by just walking what might on the face of it be seen to be a relatively short distance, but for her was a massive achievement. Um, so again, that comes back to the fact that the length of exercise that you do really is dependent on your starting point. And by, by starting slowly, by starting for a short length of time, one, two, three minutes, and building up gradually over time, you're doing yourself as much good as somebody who is an exercise person who perhaps finds it no problem to exercise for 20 or 30 minutes, but then builds up from that, that foundation instead. So I'm not going to specify how long because it would be wrong to do so, but anything is better than nothing. Leo, next slide, please. 
So how often should exercise occur? And again, I come back to the point I made in the last slide, that if, I, if we read some of the guidelines, which say three to five times a week, that suggests that one or two times a week is not enough. So I'm not going to say and specify how often exercise should be. If you aren't somebody who exercises once or twice a week, is going to be far more beneficial for you, particularly when you start exercising, than doing no exercise at all. My plea would be make exercise part of your daily life. Make sure you walk where previously you may have not done any walking. Make a conscious effort to take part in an exercise session if you don't do so already. Use the stairs instead of lifts when we're able to go back into offices. Uh, and even if you are using public transport again one day to go to work, get off a stop earlier and walk to the office or walk to your home. Bring exercise back into your lives, just as I said our ancestors used to do many thousands of years ago. So I think for me, it's regular exercise. It's not specifying a length, a duration or a frequency of exercise, but it's making sure that you have exercise as part of your life. And as I said, our research has shown very clearly that for sarcoidosis patients, there are real tangible benefits to be gained from getting back control of your life, from managing the symptoms and for getting a quality of life and less fatigue uh, that, that is way better than you would have done were you not to have exercised. So next slide, please, Leo. My, my conclusion on exercise is any form of exercise is great if it works for you. We're not all elite athletes. In fact, very, very few of us will ever be elite athletes. We all need to exercise at a level of frequency and a duration that is right for us. And anything is better than nothing. And as I said, the research that we conducted through Kingston University has shown without any shadow of a doubt that exercise is beneficial for you and it will help to combat and offset the symptoms of sarcoidosis. Next slide, please, Leo. Um, when it comes to exercise, as I say, it's a blend of exercise. It's a blend of resistance exercise to develop muscle strength and cardiovascular exercise to develop uh, the heart, the lungs and the oxygen transport capacity. And if you do that, I am absolutely confident that your quality of life will improve and you will be able to cope with the symptoms of sarcoidosis far more effectively. That's my last slide on exercise. If I have the next slide, please, Leo. What I want to do now is talk reasonably briefly about nutrition and refueling. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. One comment that I make very frequently to anybody I talk to is that the human body is a little bit like a high performance car. You can have the best car in the world, but if you put the wrong fuel into it, it won't perform properly. And the body is the same. If you've done all the right sort of exercise and you're looking after yourself correctly, if you don't fuel properly, you won't perform as well as you possibly can. So I'm a big advocate, whoever you are, whether you are somebody who just exercises for fun or in terms of looking after your body and staying healthily, fueling properly is absolutely critical. So could I have the next slide, please, Leo. Uh, some general principles, and I won't get into too much detail, but I will just give some general principles around good nutrition. Um, we have what's called macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. A good mix of those three, and I'll talk about each one individually, is absolutely critical. Alongside that, fresh fruit and vegetables to, to provide us with the vitamins and the minerals and the nutrients that we need. Maintaining energy balance is also important. What do I mean by that? Well, when we consume food and drink, we take in calories. If we take in more calories, then we expend through exercise and activity and through our general metabolic function. If we take in more than we expend, then that energy has to go somewhere. And sadly, it's stored all around the body, usually as fat stores, and our body weight will increase. So maintaining energy balance, energy in equals energy out, is absolutely essential if we're to retain a good body weight. Staying hydrated is also important. The body needs to stay hydrated for the, the, the body to function properly. Um, but the other point that I would make is um, it's very easy to walk into a, a pharmacy, into a supermarket or go online and see super, uh, supplements advertised everywhere to help you with, you with your diet and your health and fitness. I'm a massive believer in diet coming first and supplements second. So we can get the diet right, 
the macronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, and energy balance correct with good hydration, then actually, in the vast majority of cases, supplements may well not be needed. So I'm now going to talk about the three uh, macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, in just a little bit more detail. So if I could have the next slide, please, Leo. Carbohydrate. Um, carbs have had a pretty bad press, I think, over the last few years. But I think it's worth pointing out that when we do most moderate or high intensity exercise, the fuel that the body automatically uses is carbohydrate. We use carbohydrate for uh, most of the exercise that, that we do. Um, it is an important fuel for the body and carbohydrate that we eat, whether it's through pasta or potatoes, is stored uh, in the muscles and in the liver as a substance called glycogen. And it's that glycogen that the oxygen that I spoke about a few minutes ago combines with in the muscle to help in the production of energy. One gram of carbohydrate contains about four calories of energy. Just clock that figure and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment or two. Next slide, please, Leo. Um, recommendation for carbohydrate is, is 40 to 50% of calories from carbohydrate. Protein, uh, the substance that our muscles are made of, uh, again, one gram is four calories of energy. And the general recommendation is up to about 30% of energy that is consumed would come from protein. Next slide, please, Leo. And then fat. Uh, whilst fat does contain many uh, nutrients that are important for the body, you'll see that one gram of fat contains twice as many calories as a gram of either protein or carbohydrate. So when it comes to fat, we do need to be very careful because if you have too much fat in your diet, um, then the energy balance will be distorted very quickly. It's very easy to take in more calories than are expended and very quick and very easy to put on weight. Uh, not only do you put on weight visibly with fat deposits being stored around uh, the, the, the body, those fat deposits can also build up within the arteries where oxygen is, is being transported in the blood. That can raise blood pressure and increase the, the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So that's why the recommendation is for only around 10% of total calories to come from fat. Next slide, please, Leo. Uh, I mentioned the importance of fruit and vegetables. Uh, they provide the vitamins, the minerals that are needed to maintain health. And of course, very importantly as well, to sustain the immune system, um, which has been never been more important uh, as we've been in the, the COVID-19 era. So a good mix of fruit and vegetables within the diet, providing the body with the vitamins and minerals that it needs for health and well-being is absolutely critical. Uh, and we know, as I say, that that will help not necessarily to really improve the immune system but to sustain it and help to keep us healthy and, and in good shape. I'm now just going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how exercise and particularly diet can help with, with COVID-19. Um, I'm sure many of you have been concerned uh, about your own personal health and well-being with, with COVID. Um, what I would add if you go on to the next slide please Leo is that we know that exercise not only improves lung function, but exercise will help us to get oxygen from the lungs to where it is needed uh, in, in the muscles. I spoke about that three mils per of oxygen per kilogram of body weight lower limit. If we can ensure that our bodies can, can or our lungs can continue to transport that amount of oxygen to the body, then we'll have a good chance of staying healthy and staying alive. We know, with not just with the research that we've done at Kingston, but through huge amounts of research that have been done for many, many years, that exercise will improve lung function. It will create more alveoli, it will open up the lungs, it will improve that oxygen transport capacity and mean that you are better protected if a respiratory virus comes along and starts to attack your lungs. Far better to start with a high base of oxygen transport and from a low base. So I am absolutely convinced that exercise will improve lung function, will improve oxygen transport capacity, and help to ensure that you have a better chance of combat combating um, a respiratory virus. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, please, Leo, I'm conscious I've got three or four minutes to go. Um, 
We also know from numerous studies that exercise will boost and maintain the immune system. Without any shadow of a doubt, that is the case. There have been lots of studies that have shown that that is true. So again, regular exercise, which can help to boost and maintain the immune system, combined with a good diet, does give you the best chance of protection against a respiratory virus such as COVID-19. Next slide, please, Leo. Um, as well, as I've already said a few moments ago, poor nutrition will very quickly and very easily cause weight gain, cause body weight to increase. That in itself puts more strain on the heart and on the lungs. It causes respiratory stress. It puts you in a far lesser ability to, to combat the, the, the ravages of a respiratory virus. So again, uh, I'm absolutely certain that uh, healthy eating and exercise that maintain good body weight uh, will help in protection against a respiratory virus. Next slide, please, Leo. Um, really, in, in summary, healthy nutrition will sustain body weight and help to sustain and maintain the immune system. That has to be good for people with sarcoidosis. It has to be critical. It's also important, as I say, in the current COVID-19 climate. So. For me, if we can go on to the, the final slide, Leo, um, our research has shown that a combination of exercise and nutrition genuinely has lifestyle and medical benefits for anyone with sarcoidosis. And it can certainly reverse many of the physical symptoms associated with sarcoidosis. It is, in a sense, a non-invasive treatment for sarcoidosis. Uh, getting your diet right, getting your nutrition right, is, it, and getting your exercise regime right is of course something that I've grown up with, uh, with people without sarcoidosis. I believe that our research has shown that for people with sarcoidosis, it's even more important. And I'm absolutely certain that exercise and nutrition do have a really key role to play in the management of sarcoidosis uh, in the future. So if I could just go to my final slide. Uh, thank you, Leo, for um, supporting the talk very well there. Looking forward to the panel discussion. Um, I would add that I was diagnosed with sarcoidosis back in 2011. Um, I've still maintained exercise as a very important part of my lifestyle. Since being diagnosed, I run, I think it's eight London marathons. That takes me up to 20 uh, in total. I still exercise regularly. I still try and eat healthily because I am absolutely convinced as both somebody with sarcoidosis and as a professor of sport and exercise science that good exercise, good lifestyle and good nutrition really can help in the management of sarcoidosis. Uh, I've been fortunate to have been under the, the care and supervision of Dr. Kidd for I think the last three or four years. Um, I'm certainly not gonna let it stop me. I'm determined that through regular exercise, I can keep my heart, lungs, nerves, and muscles in as good a condition as possible. Uh, and very much believe, as I said this afternoon, that exercise can have a role to play in the treatment and management of sarcoidosis. So thank you very much for your time and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion and the question and answer session later on today. Thank you, back to you, Leah and Jackie. Thank you very much for that really interesting and really relevant talk, Professor Brewer. We've had some fantastic questions being submitted in the comments on YouTube and Facebook. So if you do have any more questions that have come up as a result of either of the sessions so far, please do carry on commenting. We are looking at them and we'll, we will be adding them to the list for the Q&A session. Um, now, we're going to have another 10 minute break now and we'll be back at 10 past four where we'll be having our discussion session and we'll be hearing more from, from all of the speakers today. Thank you very much and we will see you at 10 past four.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the 2021 Neurosarcoidosis Patient Day. We have had some really lovely comments coming in so far of people very grateful for, for all of the speakers for giving up their time to speak today and give such interesting talks. Our session now is going to be a roundtable discussion where we are going to be picking out topics that Jackie and I have come across in, in recent weeks. Um, through our work with the charity and we're going to be discussing them as a group and we're also going to be discussing what we would like to see in the future. So if I can ask all of the speakers to turn their cameras back on and their mics back on when they're ready. Um, just so everybody knows I might disappear for a couple of minutes towards the end of this session because I just want to double check that we've collected all the questions from Facebook and YouTube so if I disappear off the screen I am still here listening I've just gone to collect questions. Um, so I think kind of to kick us off as a, as a starting point, one of the things that I hear patients say quite regularly is that they feel that their specialists or their GPs can be quite dismissive of their neuro symptoms. So I suppose that would be a good starting off point for us for our discussion is why do we think that the specialists and GPs are so dismissive of those neuro symptoms and what's the solution? Is there anything that we could be doing as a charity? Is there anything that the people who are watching today can do to advocate for themselves better? If there's any medical professionals watching, what do they need to know? Um, any thoughts? Shall I start off? Please. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say that it is a mixture of um, arrogance and ignorance, uh, which is contributing to this. Uh, neurosarcoidosis is, um, uh, it, it's too rare. Most neurologists would see um, one or two cases in their whole uh, consultant career, which is 30 years. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the ways of um, uh, making things easier has been the, um, the creation of um, this kind of hub and spoke model of, of neurological care where the neurologist would go to the small hospital, but then would also be associated with the local teaching hospital as well. And there are 26 uh, teaching uh, hospital hubs um, in England and one, two, three, four, five in Scotland um, and three, well, two and a half in Wales. Um, uh, and um, so what we're trying to do is um, um, increase the, um, uh, the experience of people who uh, put themselves up uh, for um, a consideration of uh, becoming an expert in various different inflammatory diseases. Now, you know, you don't need someone like me in every um, uh, hospital in the, in the country. You know, I've got 600 people with neurosarcoidosis and then the next most um, 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 a proficient uh, a neurologist might have, you know, 30, something like that, you know. So uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is, is um, um, uh, <laughs> divest myself from some responsibility, I suppose, but, you know, teach other people to, um, uh, to take this on because it does need to be taken on. You know, I, I have patients who come, who leave at four in the morning uh, to come and see me for a 10 minute conversation. Now, we're not, what we normally do is we would book up a scan and we get blood tests done and we might get the respiratory tests done if no one else is doing them and make a bit of a day of it. But then they don't get home till midnight again. And you know them and their, their partners are taking time off work to drive them up and all of this. It's an absolute nightmare, you know? And so what we really need is that there would be regional centers in which trained up specialists um, in that field would be available to patients who only with them would have to travel, you know, two hours maximum, three maybe, something like that. But furthermore, in the sarcoidosis realm, uh, these people would then uh, be forced and encouraged um, to uh, develop a relationship um, like I have with um, a respiratory, a hepatology, a dermatologist, a cardiologist, um, an ophthalmologist, uh, a, a rheumatologist, uh, a, a, you know, all of those people uh, then uh, to which then the patients could gain easy access 
uh, which would um, uh, be very much uh, to the patient's interest. We'd have this kind of smooth um, um, uh, um, algorithm of, of, um, of patient care, which would improve things. Now, uh, we're trying to develop all of this. I think it would be a good idea. Things are going terribly slowly, as I mentioned, whenever I was doing my own uh, um, uh, chat. Um, but I think that will be the way forward. And I think one of the ways that um, uh, Sarcoidosis UK uh, can help with this uh, would be to, um, uh, to advocate uh, precisely that, because we are working on this. But the, the problem is, of course, that uh, you know, other things have happened and all of these kind of plans in NHS improvement have been shelved and nobody within that mechanism is, is currently thinking about things. I'm still trying to get another drug um, uh, tacked on to the infliximab policy and you know, nobody's thinking about it or even listening to, to, to what I'm saying because they're, they're busy doing all these other, uh, these other things. So I think one of the ways that uh, which uh, we could help as Sarcoidosis UK would be to raise awareness. Now, there is, there's a good uh, precedent for this. There's another condition that I deal with called Betchett syndrome, which is very, very different to sarcoid, but it's also a multi-system disease, which if it affects the nervous system can be, can be quite devastating. They, their patient group um, uh, lobbied uh, the health service very successfully alongside the, the clinicians interested in it uh, to the extent that they were able to get a, a center of excellence funded uh, for specifically for that condition. I think it'd be great to have a center of excellence for sarcoid, but I think it's it, 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 that would be complicated. You know, the respiratory form is much, much more common and you wouldn't really need one center of excellence to deal with it. You know, what you need is, as I've said already, um, uh, you know, pockets of expertise where people are not palmed off and um, told that there's nothing wrong with them just because the neurologist doesn't recognize actually that there is something wrong with them. Back to my thing about your scan's fine, you know, so therefore there's nothing I need to do for you, you know, which is absolutely uh, incorrect. And so I think that would be the way forward in this. Absolutely, yeah. And thank you so much for all your work on that so far. And at Sarkoid ACH UK, we'd be so keen and very excited to, to support that and work on that in any way that we can. Um, do, do either Jackie or Professor Brew have any thoughts on this or perhaps any other topics they'd like to bring up for discussion? Uh, Leo, I suppose my, I can only speak from personal experience in the sense that, you know, as Dr. Kidd has said, it, there is a lack of awareness, not just amongst the population, but amongst GPs. Um, and my route, as I'm sure the same with many others who are listening today to, to see Dr. Kidd, was through personal research and, and personal referral. Um, and it, for me, it kicked off when I kept falling over whilst out running. Um, and um, it was almost every run I came back from, there was another bruise or a cut somewhere and my wife was despairing. Um, really wasn't sure what was going on. And, and it was really me forcing the issue with the GP to get a referral for a condition that she had no knowledge of whatsoever. And, you know, just to, just to sort of, square the circle on that. Um, I went to see her for my flu jab in like, November or December of last year and, and said that I was quite surprised that I hadn't had my shielding letter from the infamous Mr Hancock um, telling me that I was extremely vulnerable and she said well we've decided that patients on methotrexate don't need to be shielded and I said well it's not methotrexate it's the condition that has caused that. And you could see almost a sort of a light bulb moment switch on. And genuinely a week later, um, I got my letter from Mr. Hancock. So I think there is, I just say, is it an appreciation? Is it an awareness? It's something. And I think for me, you know, if we look at Sarcoidosis UK um, and we have awareness up there as one of our key pillars that we want to achieve, it should be right up there. It, 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 it's one of the very highest ones. And I know you know, we also want to fund the research and we want to try and find a cure, but actually awareness and support uh, for, for people with sarcoidosis is, is, is absolutely critical, I think. Absolutely, I agree. And I suppose if we do start to get the awareness out there, those other things will come along as well, naturally, hopefully. Um, so I absolutely agree on, on the importance of raising awareness. Um, Jackie, I think you had a topic you wanted to bring up for discussion next. Yes, the next topic, just a second. 
Yes. So <clears throat> this one is about um, people who are started on medication. And for instance, for me, I was on azathioprine for 14 years. And my local consultant would say, well, you're on the medication. Whenever I flared, it was a case of, well, we're doing what we can and just put up with it. Um, and I felt that possibly if I had changed my medication, it may have had a better outcome for me. Um, so the question is, um, when people are already on medication, but still flare, how, how long do they wait to find out whether they need a different medication or a different dose uh, to Dr. Kidd? Um, well, uh, the answer is it depends, you know, and that's not an answer at all. I fully understand that. So, um, it, you know, what it depends on is, um, uh, you know, how often do the flares occur? How long do they last for? Um, what do we do to make them better? Um, uh, and does um, each flare result in a deterioration overall in the condition? So if there's a fluctuation, you know, which is once a year, you know, an inconvenience for two or three months, let's say, but actually for the nine months a year, everything's fine. And then, you know, you feel on average pretty much the same right the way through. That's OK. But if it's like this, you know it goes down and down and down well then you know the the, the doctors are asking for trouble um so that's what it depends on really uh, and so the answer is then unfortunately back to what we've already talked about is it the 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 person dealing with the patient needs to understand the condition enough to work out and to predict what change should be made and to what extent, you know, and is that a switch from azathioprine uh, to something stronger like mycophenolate or infliximab or from methotrexate up to something intravenous like infliximab? And of course, it does require uh, some um, uh, some experience before you can uh, you can decide that because other times, you know, and you and I have talked about this, haven't we? You know, sometimes I, I say, let's just sit tight and wait and see. Let me know in two weeks, don't I? Um, you know, and that kind of is not just, you know, I couldn't be bothered thinking about this for two weeks, I promise. But um, it's more to do with, you know, if you come back and say, actually, you know, maybe it was a cold, you know, and, and you know, I always dip down with the cold because everybody always dips down with the cold, but actually I'm feeling a whole lot better again. Well, at least I have not inflicted, um, you know, a potentially um, a harmful increase in medication as well. And so that's why it depends and that's why it, it sounds complicated, but all it requires is experience uh, and, and then it's actually not complicated at all. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Um, one thing I think we should, which we should discuss, and it's kind of building on from Professor Brewer's talk, is to do with exercise and sarcoidosis flare-ups. Um, so question to Professor Brewer, but open to input from, from everyone, really. So let's say a patient's been flaring. At what point can we trust it's time to start exercising again after, after having a flare-up? It's an interesting one, Leon, and again, there probably isn't a definitive answer to that. And I'd also say that if you're having a flare-up, um, what you might still be able to do is to continue exercising, but reduce the intensity and the duration of the exercise. And again, you know, I'm afraid one of the things that our research revealed is that, as we all know, there is very little research, unfortunately, into exercise and sarcoidosis so you can't be definitive on that but my feeling would be that if you are somebody who is exercising and you have a flare-up then you shouldn't necessarily stop altogether unless you have to you can listen to your own body reduce the frequency and the intensity of the exercise and then as the flare starts to recede so you can start to come back up and, and, and start exercising again and, and I'll come back to the point that I made in the talk that the benefits of exercise, particularly around lung function, oxygen transport, muscle function, are so great that if you do stop altogether, you might actually make the flare-up even worse. Sadly, we don't know that. There haven't been the control studies done 
to find out. But I would say that once the flare up has, has gone, then there is nothing to stop you going back. The only thing that I would just add, and this is the same with anybody, whether a sarcoidosis patient or not, if you have had to decrease the frequency and the intensity of the exercise program that you're doing for whatever reason, and for many people, it's often an injury, what you shouldn't do is try and get back to where you were within a day or two, because you'll be putting too much strain on the body. Um, you may actually be in, impacting on the immune system in a way that you don't want to, but also you're more likely to get illness or injury. So it's, it's a gradual build back up to where you were before over a, a week or two, rather than uh, thinking, right, everything's okay. Here we go. I'm, I'm back competing or, or exercising again at the level I was previously at. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Jackie, over to you for the next next point. Uh, yes, so the next point we thought we'd bring up was, um, we've heard the reports of patients flaring after the COVID vaccines. Um, Dr. Kidd, how, how has this uh, been to you? Have you, have you offered any um, advice on how to deal with this? And how long would it take to recover? Uh, so uh, a lot of people have experienced this. Um, and it, it's the way in which the, the, the immune system um, reacts to the vaccine. So don't forget, a vaccine um, stimulates the immune system to create antibodies against the, the infection uh, to which you're being immunized. Um, and in the case of the AstraZeneca one, then the reaction for everybody uh, is worse on the first than the second. Um, and in the case of the Pfizer, it's worse in the second than the, uh, the, the first. So then people with uh, immunological diseases uh, then notice that um, they have the same reaction as everybody else has, which varies. You know, some people get hardly any, some people get a whole lot. Even, you know, uh, friends of my daughter, for example, who's, who's uh, 23, uh, you know, some of them were, were laid out in, in bed for two weeks, like a proper flu after um, uh, one of the vaccines. Um, uh, but then they, they kind of pick up again. So what happens is then the immune system then says, okay, I'm being activated here. I'm already making you suffer um, an autoimmune disease. I'm going to activate it as well. So then the immune disease then, and it's the same for the Spetschert syndrome I was talking about before, sarcoidosis, arthritis, apparently all my rheumatology friends are saying, uh, you know, everything flares up because of course the source of the uh, the autoimmune condition is stimulated by the, the act uh, and the physiological consequences of, of vaccination. In the case of sarcoidosis, uh, it seems to go on for much longer uh, than, than I would like to hear, sometimes even about three months in some of the patients. But I think most of the patients feel better within about four or five, six weeks, something like that. And then they do all seem to return uh, to normal. I haven't yet, I don't think I have uh, prescribed anything extra for any of my patients during this uh, the, this flare which occurs because we usually just say let's just sit tight it does seem to settle down again and nobody uh, so far thank god has, um, ha has developed a, a really bad flare which has caused damage or anything like that. Dr Kidd I know when you when you and I have spoken we've also said that having the vaccine or any vaccine is still important even if you do have sarcoidosis. So there is no suggestion, is there, I don't think that anybody with sarcoidosis should be put off from having the vaccine. The benefits will far outweigh any illness that you might get afterwards. Exactly so. Yeah, no, that's extremely important. And that, you know, that goes even for, you know, this worry about some of the vaccines causing um, uh, uh, side effects, uh, you know, like um, thrombosis and low platelet counts and things like that. You know, the risks are so much less of that happening um, uh, than it is in, in, in getting the, uh, the disease, which is a vile disease. It's not just a respiratory um, uh, a virus, you know, it, it gets into your body and it causes blood clots and it, it destroys tissues. And, you know, we've had all sorts of things of it affecting the brains and people and people losing vision and, and people, you know, losing heart function and all sorts of different, it really is, it's a dreadful viral infection. So it, it, yeah, it must be vaccinated against. 
Yeah, thank you. So we'll go on to the, the next subject, which was, um, we understand that there are different treatments. Um, how does a person know that their treatment is the right one? <laughs> oh, um, well, um, I, I suppose um, uh, the, the right treatment would be one which would uh, immediately uh, um, allow them to, to feel better um, and then that they would notice progressively that they would continue to uh, improve. Now, there are only a few uh, um, exceptions to that. Um, you know, sometimes if the disease is, um, is getting worse quickly, it does obviously take a little bit of time for it to, um, uh, to respond to treatment. So the concept is you're going down like this. Well, obviously it has to slow down first and then kind of plateau before it can pick up again. Uh, but you should notice a response to the right kind of treatment, you know, within um, a month, six weeks of, of beginning that treatment. And as I said at the beginning, um, you know, in the case of steroids, provided the right dose is given, people usually respond very quickly, but that's not necessarily the long-term treatment for all the reasons I, I mentioned um, um, earlier on, because you become very steroid dependent um, uh, and, and you, the disease, you know, forces you to, to ingest much, much higher quantities of steroids than, than is good for your body. Okay, so the, uh, the next one is, um, what do we all want to see in the future for things to improve for myosarcoid patients? And we've already discussed your wonderful plans <laughs> or hopes. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that's right. I think in the future, uh, so maybe I'll give a little story about myself now. So, so the reason I became interested in sarcoidosis was number one, because it was interesting, uh, but number two, uh, that I realized uh, that nobody had a clue uh, about what it meant, uh, particularly sarcoidosis of the nervous system. Now, I, I was quite lucky uh, to train in, you know, all the best places. You know, there's this place called the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, and I, I spent most of my training there. I was at St. Thomas's as well, and, you know, terrific places. Uh, and, you know, the best neurologists were training me, you know. Uh, and then I realized that the best neurologists hadn't a clue about sarcoidosis. And I thought, well, someone's got to, to do this. And so the, the only reason I ended up at the Royal Free Hospital was because uh, at the time, uh, the Royal Free Hospital was the best place um, for sarcoidosis, probably even better at that time, not anymore, uh, than the Royal Brompton Hospital as well, because they were very busy doing you know, research into other conditions. Uh, and there were only, there was only really one or maybe two people interested in sarcoidosis at the Brompton at that time. Things have obviously changed now, and the Brompton's a wonderful hospital for uh, for sarcoidosis uh, now. But that that anyway is the reason why I went to the Royal Free. So I wanted to learn about sarcoidosis um, uh, of the body, um, whilst I set out to learn about sarcoidosis of the of the nervous system. And so that's taken me twenty years uh, because it's quite complicated. So um, uh, what I see in the future is that um, uh, that that um, it doesn't take you know any other neurologist twenty years to become good at something. Uh, they need to, they need to um, uh, to get good at it you know in two or three years you know, and so that mechanism that I described I think is going to be the best way of doing that, and that is going to be the best thing for the patients of the country. I know of um, one hospital who does a combined patient um, meeting where the consultants will speak to a few patients at one time so they learn from each other, um, but they still have their consultation as well. Is that something that you might do? Um. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. I, I think one of the problems, with, I think that would work well for other forms of sarcoid, but the neurological sarcoid, as we all know, uh, is very, you know, it's a personal experience, isn't it? You know, and no two patients have the same set of symptoms, even if they've got rather similar looking scans, for example, or similar looking, uh, you know, blood investigation results and things like that. 
I think it would be a terrific idea. It's kind of what this is as well, mind you, as well, isn't it? That everybody gets together and, and, and learns um, uh, from each other um, uh, as well. But that, that I think would also form part of this new thing that we are hoping to develop, which is that, you know, you can have these regional areas, you know, over seen, for example, by, you know, either one person or one place which would consider itself to have, you know, the, the final say in what is right and wrong. Um, and, and, um, and all sorts of different ways of, of helping patients could, uh, could come through, um, uh, through, through that. Jackie, if I, if I might make a, a quick comment there, I think I've been very fortunate over the years, as you, as you said at the start, to work with many of the top sports coaches and sports athletes in, in the country and a common mantra that runs through the ones that do really well the great ones is that they take responsibility for their own performance and they've got the coach on the sidelines who tells them what to do but when they go out on the athletics track or the field of play they take responsibility and I think for me what we need to aspire to is, is a, a world where we've got the great experts like Dr Kidd who can help and advise and provide the medication, but also an awareness amongst sarcoidosis patients that you can take responsibility for your own life and your own lifestyle. And you can help get yourself fitter, help get your diet correct, live the right type of lifestyle. Because it's only by getting the two working together that you can have that quality of life that you want to have. And if you just simply sit back and, and just rely on the medication and the expertise of Dr. Kidd and colleagues, then you're in a sense passing all the onus on them to get you well. And I think we do all have a responsibility to say, hey, hang on a minute. Yes, we've got great people and great medication, but what can I do myself to help me live my life in, in a way that I want to? And so I think that that's certainly a, a message that I've tried to, to live to. And I think that there's, there's real potential to do that more and more through people getting together and sharing thoughts and sharing ideas and, and just being proactive in how they live their lives. Yes, thank you. Yes, I agree with that as well. Hi, Leo. I'm back. Sorry, I was just going through all of the questions. We've had some fantastic ones sent in and I really look forward to, to getting some answers to them. So are we going to move on to the question and answer? I, I think we, we can move on to the question unless there's any topics that Dr. Kidd or Professor Beer want to bring up. Otherwise, we can start the Q&A. Brilliant. Okay. Jackie, shall we wait? These are all questions that have been sent in either in advance of the patient day or that have come in live through Facebook and YouTube. So Jackie and I now both have a copy of all the questions. Jackie, do you want to start us off? And then we'll sure. go in place? Yeah, that's fine. So the very first question is, how does someone know if they have neurosarcoidosis? Would there be specific symptoms or is it found by chance through an investigation or something else? If the latter, how can a clinician be sure that it is neurosarcoidosis? Oh, that's a terrific question. So, so the answer is that um, if something happens to your nervous system, then you know about it. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you can't function without a functioning nervous system. As Professor Brewer said, you know, uh, you know the, uh, everything comes back to the nervous system, even the way the heart works and how the gut works and, and everything else is not just the brain. Um, and if it stops working, then um, it doesn't just kind of shut down and it's obvious, you know, subtle things occur and they tend to um, uh, develop and accrue um, over a couple of weeks, let's say. So, you know, a headache could develop, as I've mentioned, uh, or, you know, a, a different way of, of thinking, you know, and then family members may say, are you okay? You know, what's going on? Uh, you know, you're not, uh, you know, this, this as bright as you usually are. I don't mean intelligent, I mean, you know, sparky and, um, you know, this kind of thing. Um, or um, there could be you know, it, it's been mentioned, you know, tripping up when running, for example, or <clears throat> developing numbness or double vision or a change of uh, vision or hearing or balance, all of these kinds of things um, uh, can develop. So then um, you go to the GP, the GP says, okay, this doesn't seem right, you know, we better get you to see a neurologist. So then the neurologist then would be responsible for doing the, the, the tests. 
Um, and whether or not you currently know you've got sarcoidosis, uh, it does make it more complicated then. Um, and there are patients who, in whom the neurologist may not do necessarily understand that sarcoidosis could cause this, uh, and then they don't necessarily do all of the investigations which might allow the uh, the patient to be diagnosed. But sometimes it's it's um, it's just rather lucky as well. You know, the, the junior doctor says, "Okay, well, he wants me to arrange a brain scan, so I'll do that on some blood tests." But why don't we do an ECG and a chest X-ray as well? You know, that's the normal thing to do. We'll just check over the body in general, and then, oh my goodness, the chest X-ray! Look at all these lymph glands. You know, we weren't expecting this because the the, the person didn't say, uh, you know, that she had a cough or, or, a, or, or chest pains or anything or breathlessness or anything. And then off it goes, you know. But then in other times, then back to the, the brain, for example, then um, uh, the brain um, uh, scan, as I've shown you, uh, looks very um, strange um, whenever it is in, affected by sarcoidosis or a process like that. Very different to a stroke very different to a tumour, very different to multiple sclerosis, which of course can cause very similar um, uh, symptoms. Um, and then uh, you move on then to the other tests. You know, the blood tests don't tend not to be very helpful unless the ACE level is raised, but it's only raised in 30% of people. Um, and uh, the spinal fluid uh, tends to show abnormalities which are different to the abnormalities you would see with an infection or with, with a tumour or again with multiple sclerosis. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, people tend to, um, uh, to be able to work it out. But there's still patients either incorrectly diagnosed <clears throat> or who are not diagnosed because um, it is assumed that it's, it's another condition or that they don't actually just do the final thing which is give this and do the scan with the with the uh, with the injection. I have this um, other problem which I, I face repeatedly which is that uh, some neurologists feel that um, uh, sarcoidosis uh, can cause um, uh, certain kinds of conditions uh, and they, they, they base the diagnosis only on the fact that it's not MS or something like that. It's not MS, it's not a tumour, it's not an infection, it must be sarcoidosis, you know. And so I spend a bit of time um, uh, undiagnosing people previously diagnosed whenever I do not uh, agree with that uh, diagnosis. And that's extremely important um, uh, with the, the treatments we have available now. Infliximab, for example, makes multiple sclerosis worse, not better. Uh, certain uh, treatments for MS can induce sarcoidosis or make it worse. Uh, arthritic ones I've already mentioned can also uh, do that too, which require uh, changes to, uh, to medications. So, um, so there's a very long answer to a, an extremely important question, which is again, back to the fact that, you know, you just have to hope that the people advising you have the experience and uh, an understanding and the patience uh, to go through uh, um, uh, what is usually a complicated diagnostic process, uh, identifying an exceedingly rare um, and complicated disease. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Not really a question, this one, but something that came in as we were having our discussion about what we'd like to see in the future. Um, Sarah on YouTube wrote, as patients, what we would like to see in the future is a clone of Dr. Kidd, so that all consultants would be able to treat us <laughs> with knowledge, commitment, and kindness. So a very, very lovely comment coming in. Um, that sounds like a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is for Professor Brewer. Is there any exercise that you would recommend for an elderly patient disabled by sarcoidosis, has an old ankle injury, and for whom any walking is quite painful? And have you any suggestions for those whom exercise causes coughing and weakness? So kind of two parts to that question. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the first one is, it sounds as if non-weight-bearing exercise is the best thing for that person. The, the, the two obvious ones, therefore, to go for is something like cycling, um, and I'd recommend a static bike rather than one that takes you out onto the, the roads just from a safety perspective. You can have a really low resistance, um, just turn the pedals over gently and, and, and gradually get the, the heart and the lungs working. The other one, of course, is, is swimming, um, but swimming is, is slightly harder if, if you're not a big swimming fan, but swimming is also non-weight bearing. So I would say either of those two, Leo would be the best ones, but don't be worried 
and this 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 stand this this whole story. But don't be worried about starting at a low intensity. There is nothing wrong with low intensity exercise. And just because you see other people out there sweating and running half marathons or or in a gym, you know, pumping weights and so on, you don't have to be like that. It's as I said, it's tolerable. It's it's a low intensity that would work. So, but but non weight bearing swimming and cycling would probably be the best thing. Um, in terms of if you have uh, have a cough, respiratory issues. Again, it, it's, it's that chicken and egg situation because I firmly believe that if you can start to do low intensity exercise, which is taking more air into the lungs, it's helping to develop lung function, it's opening opening up the, the, the tremendous network of, of, of alveoli bronchioles that are within the lungs, then you will potentially help to offset the cough so I wouldn't be put off by the cough it may well be that if you can start to exercise in a, a low intensity environment the benefits to the lungs will mean that actually potentially the cough may actually get get better so that would be my my suggestion on that. Thank you very much very, Professor Brewer very useful. Um, Jackie over to you. Sure thing here's the next one so um, someone's asking um, I've developed voice and throat problems and suspect that they're related to my sarcoidosis. My throat seems to swell up, especially when eating, and my voice seems to change to a nasally goat type voice. Have any of the learned professors and doctors ever come across this weird problem in their long experience? Yes. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> it's... Um, uh, they're, they're, uh, there's a subgroup of patients who um, have, uh, this is back to these cranial nerves that I talked about at the beginning. So the ones at the very bottom of the brain then look after the movements of the tongue, the coordination of the muscles of the pharynx, which is the, the tube connecting the mouth to the, uh, to the gullet. Um, and, and also the voice box as well. And so patients uh, with that uh, often uh, notice a, a change in their voice. Um, it tends to be quieter. Uh, it tends to become uh, not hoarse in the way uh, that it would be hoarse with laryngitis, but it, it's, um, it becomes um, breathy. So you can hear the air um, as well as the, as the voice. Um, uh, and, and some people often feel that it's a bit like being strangled as well, you know, it gets um, squeezed like that. And this is to do with the fact that the vocal cords then don't close properly. Uh, and, uh, and in more extreme uh, circumstances, then you can also get problems with swallowing as well. And a very extreme example would be that if you drink a glass of water and it goes down the wrong way and you can hear it all bubbling at the back of your throat, you sometimes have to cough it up. Sometimes even uh, the water actually would come up as you cough and go down through your nose as well, which is, again, a disorder of the coordination of uh, muscles as the swallowing process um, uh, occurs. Uh, the, the brain scans tend to tend not to show up uh, any abnormality, um, but uh, in, in the one, the, like I've said before, the spinal fluid is normally active if the test is done. Um, but uh, I normally, because I've, I re I've recognized it so many times, I normally just treat it as if it were related to sarcoidosis uh, and I, I've not yet failed uh, to make people better in doing that. So uh, I think the, um, the questioner should, uh, should get it looked at uh, carefully carefully by a neurologist and um, possibly an ENT as well. There's all sorts of other things uh, that can do this as well. Uh, and the most basic thing would be you can get a reflux thing, you know, uh, particularly side effects of, of uh, painkillers or steroids, where you actually get acid um, uh, burning the back of your throat and that can cause rather similar uh, symptoms as well. But uh, the uh, neurologist can usually tell the difference between the two. And finally, uh, an ENT could, uh, could check and make sure there wasn't an infection in the larynx as well. So it definitely needs to be looked into. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kidd. Um, the next question from somebody who says, thank you very much for this great patient day. My question is, many of us have phantosmia. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Specifically- I didn't hear what it was, here, sorry. Phantosmia, specifically- Phantosmia, yeah. Yeah, so they, we smell tobacco smoke when nobody is smoking. Is this a problem located in the central nervous system or can it be lo local in the epithelium of the nose? 
could it be a sign of neurosarcoidosis? Uh, so yes to everything, unfortunately. So phantosmia uh, is usually a, a nose or a sinus problem, um, uh, and um, uh, but it can also uh, occur if the um, this olfactory nerve that I mentioned, uh, which looks after um, smell. Uh, doesn't um, send the correct information to the brain, so it's not recognized as, as the correct smell. The way of telling would be to, uh, to test out different kinds of smells to see if you can actually still smell them. Uh, sometimes uh, the sense of taste is, is disturbed as well, uh, not because uh, of the taste, but actually because tasty food is, is smelly food, that's why. Um, but um, so it's usually a, a nose or a sinus problem. In the brain, it can, there rarely yeah, you can get um, uh, problems with the nerves of smell, as I've mentioned, and occasionally the part of the brain which looks after um, uh, the understanding of senses as well. Um, uh, so, you know, emotions and, uh, and memories and this thing called deja vu that people talk about and things like that, that can occasionally cause phantosmia as well. Okay. And is cigarette smoke the most the most common smell that people are, that people are getting? It's usually an unpleasant smell. Yeah. So cigarette smoke and you know cow manure, you know things like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Jackie, your turn. Yeah. So it's a question for both of you experts. Next, um, it's more about rehab. I'm now working with community mm. physiotherapy in conjunction with hydrotherapy to try and build up movement and dexterity, et cetera. Hydrotherapy for the ability to do it in a safe, non-impact way. Is this something where possible patients should look to accessing? And would this be something that would be supported? Situation dependent. My mobility is significantly less than before illness. I ask because I have noted other neurological illnesses, disorders, access to support, but not heard of our Facebook people appearing to access this. Shall I kick off on that one? <laughs> Jackie, yeah, absolutely. Hydrotherapy is a great form of um, non-weight bearing exercise. And if you have a good hydrotherapist, a physiotherapist who works with you, then they can uh, improve joint mobility and, and it will enable you to exercise in a very safe way. The other, the other advantage is that generally speaking the humidity is reasonably high in swimming pools and that can help I think sometimes with, with, with the cough and with lungs so you've got a, a, a more moist environment within the atmosphere which is beneficial. Um, I, I think it will probably vary from, from one place to another but I, I would think a GP who has links with physiotherapists and, and where of course there is a pool available may well be able to find a route into hydrotherapy for patients who do need it. Um, you know, again we've spoken earlier about the, the need for more research and need for more advice. This may well be something where we can start to more, ad um, more actively advocate for something like hydrotherapy as a form of rehab uh, for patients with sarcoidosis who find other forms of exercise to be to be difficult. So I would certainly say, yes, there's a big tick in the box um, for hydrotherapy as a form of exercise and rehabilitation uh, for sarcoidosis patients. Yes, and one of the one of the problems is in the health service that it's much less available than it used to be. Unfortunately, I've, I've got very negative experiences of trying to uh, get people um, involved in, in hydrotherapy. Um, they don't have it at my hospital anymore. They have it up at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital still, thank goodness. But I'm reasonably certain it's the only hospital in the whole of London now which has a hydrotherapy pool run by physiotherapists, which is very disappointing. Okay. Um, our next question um, is from somebody who has problems in the lower stomach and bladder dysfunction. So voiding, no sensing of level, muscle weakness in that area. Known sarcoidosis and small prolapse L4 slash L5. And wants to know how to acknowledge or differentiate if the bladder problems originate more likely in the sarcoidosis or in the prolapse or something else. 
Um, so the, if the disc prolapse is, uh, is there, but it's not actually uh, pinching uh, the nerves on both sides, then it wouldn't cause the bladder problem. Um, and so then they'd need to find out uh, other reasons uh, for that. So if the bladder is insensitive, so in other words, if the patient doesn't feel that the bladder is full and, uh, and also um, it doesn't feel whenever the bladder has either emptied or only half emptied, a lot of people will understand what I mean, um, uh, then uh, that's much more of a neurological problem and it wouldn't be related to the, to the disc prolapse. Uh, and so the part of the nervous system in sarcoidosis where that can occur is in that region, which I call the corda equina, which is the part of the base of the spine. But you tend also to have other symptoms, numbness in the feet, numbness up at the back of the legs, for example, um, uh, and... Um, um, uh, and occasionally some weakness of the, of the toes, for example, which might cause a balance problem. So there are often other uh, neurological symptoms that a neurologist or a GP could, uh, could spot, which might uh, lead to the identification of, a, of, another, uh, of another problem. So it slightly depends on you know, the severity of the, the symptoms and what the exam would be whenever the GP does a neurological exam as well. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, some days I manage okay with my stick, have numb fingers and feet, right and left sided weakness, numbness and spine and left scapula pain, sometimes really painful. How are some days manageable, other days spasmatic? Is this just part of it? I was diagnosed with neurosarcoid March 2020, on microphenolate, one gram a day and prednisolone, five milligrams daily, Thanks for your response. So uh, the, the symptoms imply that there's um, an inflammation of the spinal cord. So I presume that that's where the neurosarcoidosis lies. The pain across the shoulders and the scapulae uh, is probably a nerve pain at the, at the upper level of where the inflammation is. So whenever the inflammation develops in the spinal cord, it spreads out into the nerve roots as well, uh, which often causes um, um, uh, um, uh, pain, but it feels like a sort of funny, raw, sort of burning kind of um, uh, pain. Uh, people sometimes get it right across their chest as well as an isolated um, uh, condition uh, without um, signs of, of uh, inflammation of the spinal cord. But in this case, it sounds like um, the um, uh, the inflammation in the spine is, is um, either still there or it's not settling quickly. Um, and what to do next would rather depend on um, what the, uh, the scan, you know, four or five months after beginning treatment looks like really. If things aren't settling, uh, then um, uh, perhaps a higher dose of microphenolate because 500 is a very small dose um, or a, a burst of steroids just to get things moving whilst we're waiting for the, the higher dose of microphenolate to work or moving on to something else like infliximab. Uh, that was a dose of one gram a day. One gram, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, still, it's still a small so, dose. Yeah, 500 twice a day is only small. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is for everyone really. Should people with sarcoidosis try to strengthen their immune systems? And if so, how? Uh, I'll, I'll kick off and just say, yeah, I mean, the obvious thing is, is, is to make sure that you do what you can in terms of exercise, which, as I said, there's plenty of research to show that exercise will help to sustain the immune system and plenty of research to show that a good, healthy diet will sustain the immune system. So um, it, it's an easy answer, really. Of course, you should. Um, and whilst you cannot make yourself bulletproof, if you like, um, through diet and exercise, if you get them wrong, or, and if you, if you don't do the right things, then clearly you're going to weaken your immune system. Um, and even, you know, looking out the, the window at the moment, it, the, the sun is peeping through, you know, making sure you go outside, get some sunlight to boost vitamin D and so on, all can be helpful. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll take it back to sport. Um, there, there was a, a certain Sir David Brailsford who coached the British cycling team, who, talk, who brought in a phrase called marginal gains, which is just all about all the little things that you can do that when you put them together can make a big difference. So I would argue that there are plenty of marginal gains that you can get from getting your diet right, your lifestyle right, and your exercise right, that will help you 
to manage, cope with, uh, and, and deal with sarcoidosis and have a good quality of life? So the, the simple answer is yes. Thought it might be. Um, okay, Jackie. Can I, can, I, can I just follow that on with, we have had a lot of people who have said that they have been given vitamin D by their doctors and then ended up with hypercalcemia because of the sarcoidosis um, tendency to cause <coughs> too much active vitamin D, which causes too much calcium. So we just need to say, well, what is it? The recommended dose is 30, 15 minutes a day or something for um, normal vitamin D. But if you do have hypercalcemia, you'll get different advice. What do you think, Dr. Kidd? Yeah, so 10% um, so of people with sarcoid, uh, with active sarcoid, have a sensitivity to vitamin D, which can lead to high calcium levels. People, those 10% who are um, on treatment um, would not retain that sensitivity. Um, and the way to, if we, if we meet someone who has... Um, uh, uh, problems with calcium whenever they come in, if the kidneys get involved, it can, sometimes it can cause problems with the eyes and with the muscles. Um, then the treatment for the high calcium due to sarcoidosis is to give steroids. So in other words, you treat the sarcoid and the sensitivity to vitamin D diminishes. So um, um, people should be safe to take vitamin D or to exercise outside uh, or even just to kind of sit and, um, and enjoy the, um, uh, the brightness um, provided their condition is adequately treated. Um, and so then they'd have to check to make sure that their condition was um, uh, adequately treated. In other words, that it had been rendered inactive, uh, then it would be safe for them to, um, uh, to expose themselves to vitamin D. And can so we go back to the... Sorry. I was just going to say some of my patients know that I do give them vitamin D because there's another problem, which is that very low vitamin Ds can actually make the immune system um, overwork uh, abnormally even more. So then you've got this kind of um, uh, balance to, to achieve. What I do is, uh, provided the, uh, the GPs agree, to monitor the calcium level very quickly and frequently. Uh, and we might even sometimes increase the steroid dose a little bit just to compensate. Then it usually turns out to be perfectly safe. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask, should we go back to that question about strengthening the immune system? Because sometimes people might think that an overactive immune system is a too strong immune system. It's interesting you should say that, Jackie, because um, th there's a very good um, immune exercise um, expert, a guy called Professor Mike Gleason, who's at, at Loughborough. And, and his view worrying to be here is that actually you, you can't really improve the immune system. You can't suddenly take it from where it is and, and boost it. What you can do is to sustain it and stop it getting, getting worse. So I, I think we need to just be reflective on the fact that you can't suddenly, if, if you could put a measure of, of the immune system and say it's at 100%, it's, sometimes it's very hard to take it from 100% to 120 or 130% just by do, doing, you know, taking things, whatever. what you can do is ensure that it doesn't drop down below normal and where it should be. So I think we shouldn't be afraid um, about the potential to suddenly get a super, you know, to suddenly take it into a particularly high level through diet and exercise. And you did use the word support the immune system, not... Yeah, I can see <laughs> stuff on that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, let's go back to our list of questions. Next one is, can neurosarcoidosis cause gastric issues? And what is the best treatment plan to help with this if it is neurosarcoid involvement? So, um, uh, so there are three main parts, really. Uh, one, number one, and the most frequent, is that the treatment of neurosarcoidosis causes the gastric issues. Steroids can do it. Uh, methotrexate can do it. Azathioprine can do it. Um, and so that's, that's number one, really. Number two um, is that sarcoid can affect the stomach itself. So it may not necessarily be the neurological uh, problem, but actually um, uh, you can have um, sarcoid of the stomach. It tends to cause a, a 
boring uh, kind of um, a piercing sort of pain often going into the back with a sense of, of intolerance of food. So food makes it feel worse. Um, and then the, uh, the last one uh, that I, I mentioned just very, very briefly at the end of my um, uh, chat was, um, uh, was that uh, in patients who've got a small fibre neuropathy, they can sometimes get a disorder which is called gastroparesis, uh, which is uh, that the, the nerve function of the stomach becomes um, um, irregular, uh, which means that the stomach doesn't empty on time, uh, and so then food doesn't get delivered into the bowel, uh, which means that it doesn't get um, uh, metabolized and absorbed properly. Jackie, do you want to take the next question? Oh, yes, here we go. I'm just looking for the next one. Um, so I think we're on the one. Oh yes, um, someone's asking, their daughter is aged 11 and due to start high school, uh, September 2021, after 18 months of being homeschooled through the pandemic. It's a small rural high school, but how safe is this with a parent on immunosuppression and with new variants? Are the jabs providing effective relief? She won't qualify for vaccination until she's 12 if it's agreed. And also she has a severe nut allergy. So that's that one. So it sounds like the, the mum or the dad is the patient and the daughter is well, but 11 and going to high school. Is that what, that's what it sounds like. So, 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 um, so uh, yeah, there's, we've got a lot of patients like this who are, are obviously uh, concerned. And so, you know, it's very complicated. Um, uh, and, you know, we know that the prevalence of the infection um, is not that high in, in school. And it sometimes goes up to about 10%, which, you know, can make it quite high. Um, uh, and we know, of course, obviously uh, as well that, um, you know, although, um, the, they do their best in the schools to, you know, have different uh, classes in at different times and all of these kinds of things. Of course, as soon as they go outside into the um, uh, the front yard, then they all put their arms around each other and play football and rugby and wrestle at each other to the ground and everything else, uh, and then walk home with each other. So, you know, there's not much that anyone can do about that, uh, really. Um, I think the only way forward is to allow children to be vaccinated as well. I think that's very complicated at the moment. Um, uh, you know who gives consent uh, for their for their child to be uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, you know uh, if, if the child isn't allowed to give consent um, herself. Um, so the the um, the advice I have given uh, to similar circumstances is that. Um, you know, there's not much you can do, but as soon as the child comes home, then she would change her clothes, she would wash her hands for 20 seconds, um, and uh, there wouldn't be any kind of, you know, jumping up into the arms and, uh, you know, big slobbery old kiss like parents love their children to give them. Uh, and, they, so the, you know, the family unit would then just have to be careful. And that's an extremely unsatisfactory um, uh, answer, but of course it's the optimum way of doing it isn't it and the other thing i would add on top of that jackie i'm, I'm chair of governors at a, a school near here which has um, pupils from four up to 17 18 um we are very very pleased about the fact that the school the summer holidays are about to start and i think that six or seven week fire break for one of a better description that the summer holidays will give us will hopefully mean that the situation come the, the autumn term will be better. There will be more people vaccinated, younger people will have been vaccinated. Um, and I know I can speak firsthand, as, as Dr. Kinnard just said, that schools are doing all that they can, but the inevitable practicality is that school children will want to, to mix. Um, you know, certainly the advice as well would be lateral flow testing, get onto the government website, get the kit sent to your home test yourself frequently, test your, your, your offspring frequently, and just manage the situation as best you can. But hopefully come September, um, there will have been a bit of a break. And certainly I've seen the number of um, cases today has gone up yet again in, in the UK. Hopefully we will have reached that peak and be back on the down, downward slope again. Yeah. 
Thank you both. Um, next question is quite a long one. Since being diagnosed in 1999, I've had Bell's palsy, numbness in various parts of my body, a very weak, heavy arm and balance problems. Since then, I've accumulated a lot of other symptoms too, as well as years. I've presumed thinning hair, loss of bone in my mouth and the marked degeneration in my spine. I read regularly on the Neurosarcoidosis Facebook group page that other people attribute all manner of things to their sarcoidosis. How would I know? I was diagnosed with sleep apnea in 2018 and I have clear airway apneas as well as obstructive apneas. These apparently can be caused by a neurological problem rather than a mechanical problem. I haven't seen a neurologist since 2018 and I've tried many times to telephone to request an appointment but without success. In 2019 I was told I was top of the list for the next clinic in my area but this never happened. I have given up trying and I'm left wondering. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, so the, the bell palsy is a feature as, as uh, we've uh, discussed. The other symptoms uh, could reflect um, a spinal cord um, uh, problem with the numbness in the arms, for example. Uh, and if they think that the sleep apnea syndrome is not obstructive sleep apnea, for example, to having you know a tissue around the uh, the throat, for example, then um, uh, then um, uh, it can certainly be uh, caused by uh, uh, neurological problems. It's not common uh, for this to occur, uh, but it certainly would need to be uh, looked into um, uh, in in detail. Um, uh, so, well. I think it, it does need to be looked into. I think it's disappointing the local uh, place is not um, uh, uh, prepared uh, to help. Uh, and I think under those circumstances, uh, if um, the questioner um, uh, wants to come down and see me, for example, then I'd be perfectly happy if the GP agreed to um, uh, to take it on and, and just do a bit of a, a checkup, really, just to see what we've got. You know, it's perfectly okay to do that. You know, there is this rare disease charter um, it, through the NHS, which um, uh, means that patients with rare diseases uh, don't have to um, access the local um, uh, treatment pathways um, if it is felt that the local treatment pathways aren't sufficient. Uh, and so GPs are allowed to prescribe um, uh, into the, um, uh, the, the more specialized places. So the next one is, um, does fibromyalgia run alongside sarcoidosis? I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia first, then sarcoidosis after biopsies and chest x-rays. That is the question. Okay, well, so everyone knows what I think about fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is a symptom not a disease. And uh, if someone diagnoses fibromyalgia, then they're a lazy doctor. So it's, it's a, a, a way out of, um, um, of, of, of um, uh, providing an explanation to the patient suffering from the symptoms um, uh, and working out what the right kind of treatment is. So fibromyalgia is a constellation of symptoms predominated by um, easy fatigue, which Professor Brewer has talked about extremely uh, clearly um, and is very, very prevalent um, in, um, um, uh, in sarcoidosis and in a lot of other um, uh, inflammatory um, autoimmune diseases. Um, and uh, it's often dominated also by uh, uh, aches and pains in the muscles. The muscles aren't necessarily weak, but they feel that they're not as strong as they, they were before. And these are all symptoms uh, which uh, come about because of the immune activation which causes the, uh, the disease. Um, and a lot of people diagnosed with fibromyalgia who are given proper treatment for their, uh, their condition notices that the fibromyalgia rather miraculously resolves. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Um, the next question comes from somebody who says, I'm in three, uh, three years in remission now, but I still feel very poorly every day. I really would love to have some kind of life back. What, could, what advice could we give to this person? 
Leo, Leo, I saw this question. It was posted before before today, wasn't it? And and my thought, and I meant to mention it when I when I finished, is that um, I, I believe in goal setting. Um, it, it's something that I think we all do in our lives at, at times. But I think if you, if you are in that situation, um, it, there is a lot to be gained by setting a goal for some form of exercise that you you can do. It means you will get out, you will start doing a bit more, and your self um, self fulfilment and, and your personal image of yourself will improve if you can achieve that goal. And the one that is very, very popular at the moment, and I'm sure there are many people already guessing what I'm going to say, is the couch to five potato, couch to five potato, couch to five k goal. Um, it's been a long afternoon. Couch to five k, which it's so many people are doing. There's great advice online as to how to do it. Um, and even if you don't quite reach it, even if you do couch potato to three k, it's still something that will help bring some fulfilment and enjoyment and self-pride to your life. So I would encourage not just the person who asked that question, but anybody out there who isn't doing anything at the moment, feeling a bit fed up with coming out of yet another lockdown, set yourself a goal, whatever it might be. And um, if, if that's exercise based, um, A, it will get you out and about, uh, B, it will get you fitter and healthier and see the achievement of that goal will certainly give you a lot more um, pride in your own body and what you've what you're able to do. Thank you. Here, here's another question for you, Professor Brewer. Um, this question is um, from Craig Ross. I was diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis four years ago, and I've been on prednisolone ever since I was diagnosed. I've recently been told that by my GP that I'm pre-diabetic from the steroids. What kind of diet should I be on to help with this and also benefit my sarcoidosis? And will this rectify itself once I'm off the steroids? Um, in terms of diet, Jackie, I think it would be wrong of me to be too prescriptive on that because clearly you do need to make sure that the diabetes is under control. And I'm assuming that there'll be regular um, tests or insulin that, that's involved with that. My, my recommendation would be really going back to what I said, which is a sensible diet not too much sugary foods, um, but carbohydrate through the, the starchy foods, uh, a blend of, of protein and fat, and also the, 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 the vitamins and minerals from fruit and vegetables. And as long as you are sensible and controlled and getting a, the proper advice and medication from your GP, that diet should be fine. What I, would, what I would add is that there are things that you shouldn't do, and clearly what you shouldn't be doing is missing meals, um, and getting yourself in, in, into some sort of fasting situation where you, you can get into, into difficulty. But regular small meals, keep making sure that you're on, in control of your diet is probably the best advice that I would, would want to give this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brewer. Um, next question, it comes in two parts. So firstly, how and to whom would a Scottish woman already diagnosed with sarcoidosis, be referred to a neurosarcoid specialist to explore possible neurosymptoms for further diagnosis. She is currently undergoing initial treatment with a geriatric nurse due to short-term memory problems, amongst other things. Secondly, should her memory issues prove to be neurosarcoid and therefore possibly treatable, but only within a relatively short time frame, who would make this determination and decide upon the necessary medication. So, um, well, the, the two things are connected, really. So she needs to get connected up to a, a neurologist um, uh, with with experience, and then even uh, if it was found that there was a, a memory disorder for another uh, reason, uh, that that neurologist should be able, through the investigations, which he would he or she would do, uh, would be able to define the right kind of treatment. Um, the Health Service in Scotland is, is separate from the Health Service in England, um, 
uh, and uh, it's it's difficult to be referred uh, from Scotland um, into the English Health Service, even if it's um, uh, due to neurosarcoidosis. It's not impossible, but it, it runs through uh, the mechanism of a consult neurologist um, uh, asking uh, the health service to to allow this uh, on the basis that um, uh, that that neurologist feels it's in the patient's interest to allow them to do that. There are some excellent neurologists in Scotland. Um, there are uh, there's good experience of um, sarcoidosis, particularly in Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Um, and I understand also in Dundee, actually, um, uh, and um, uh, I'm sure that uh, the GP would, um, uh, would arrange that. It would be best to go straight into a centre rather than go to a local um, hospital, first of all, because sometimes people get squeezed quickly into memory clinics and things like that, and it turns out the memory clinics aren't even run by and neurologists and uh, I'm slightly she implies that, that that may be the pathway that she's been put into um, um, so far and so it'd be good uh, to ask the GP to refer her to one of the main city uh, uh, type uh, hospitals that exist in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is simple uh, Dr Kidd. What is the best treatment for sarcoidosis in the cervical spine from C2 to T1? <laughs> simple. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, it, it's it, back to what I said before. So, if it settles e quickly uh, and easily with steroids and immune suppression, then that's the best treatment for it. Um, if it is slow to settle, uh, then uh, infliximab would be required on top of that as well. Okie dokie. Next question is, my main neurosarcoidosis symptom is stiffness, numbness, pins and needles, and neuropathic pain in feet, legs, glutes, and muscles. I have lesions on my spinal cord. I assume there is nothing wrong with my legs and that this is referred pain from the activity in my spine. Would that be correct? That's correct, yeah. So they need to clear the lesions in the spinal cord and then the symptoms will improve. Okay, thank you very much. So next question is, in relation to there was nothing on the scan, so you don't have neurosarcoidosis, if someone has a clear MRI with contrast and a clear lumbar puncture, does this mean that symptoms are not caused by neurosarcoidosis? Not necessarily. Uh, it does reduce the, uh, so it's all to do with, I, I didn't, I realised after I finished that I didn't actually make this clear enough uh, to everybody. Um, so it, if you imagine it's a kind of a threshold really, so there's um, the disease is, is gentle and quiet uh, and then it gradually increases. And so what happens first is that you can pick up um, uh, abnormalities in the spinal fluid, because don't forget a lumbar puncture actually is cells within and bathing the nerves and so if there's an inflammation there then they they that will be detected um it wouldn't necessarily show up on the on the scans uh even with contrast but then as the condition worsens because there uh, would be a greater number of uh, inflamed areas and granulomas then you're more likely then to see it on the on the scan and so the the, the point i was meant to have made which i realized i had failed to make clearly enough um, is that people whose scans are normal can still have neurological involvement because it's just below the threshold of the, the scan. Now, I also mentioned that uh, the scans are much bigger and stronger and, and the computer systems are much better to show things up in much greater resolution. So we're seeing much more on the scans that we used to see. We're even looking at very high uh, magnetic field strength and we're, we're experimentally and we're hoping to see all sorts of things that we've never been able to see with, uh, with neurosarcoid as well. Um, uh, and so the... Um, 
it, so the answer is that it could still be neurological involvement, but by those two definitions, uh, the fact that there's really nothing detectable um, on the scan or within the spinal fluid, it must only be very, very mild. And so then the next question is, if, 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 if it's that mild, uh, but yet the symptoms are intrusive, surely there may be another reason for this, because um, you know, just because you've got sarcoidosis doesn't mean that you don't have a different uh, condition which may be contributing to these symptoms. So it would be very important not just to sit back and think, well, maybe it is all sarcoid. We need to think about alternative explanations for this. Thank you. Um, our next question. Would a regular NHS spinal neurologist or surgeon who doesn't specialise in sarcoidosis spot what to look for on spinal MRI scans? Um, well, so the, uh, the scans are looked at by radiologists uh, and radiologists uh, who look at um, uh, um, uh, neurological imaging are neuroradiologists uh, and they are all actually very highly trained. Um, um, it's a bit like, um, uh, you know, other specialists, so they, they do a degree in radiology first and then they have to specialize up into the neurological radiology. Uh, and most of those in my experience are, um, are, are very, very good at spotting um, the difference between various inflammatory uh, conditions. Um, and um, uh, so it, it should be the radiologist who advises the, uh, the doctors then uh, about what abnormalities exist. And some radiologists even actually provide a, a set of differential diagnoses to account for the appearances on the scan to help the, uh, the neurologist or the neurosurgeon uh, run additional tests if the appearances are atypical. Thank you. Next question is, can weightlifting or heavy exercise do more harm than good when neurosacroid is active and on treatment? Will this attract granulomas to parts of the body? I don't have them. I can't un answer the, the specifics, Jackie, but what I would say is, is that weight heavy weightlifting is, is not an ideal form of exercise for people with sarcoidosis. It, it, it doesn't give that stimulation to the cardiovascular system and, and the lungs and the nerve system and the muscles that is, that is important. So I have never been a big fan of heavy weightlifting or heavy resistance exercise. I'd always advocate that it's lower resistance, higher repetition, that is actually what people with sarcoidosis and indeed the general population want as, as the best form of exercise. And I probably will stop at that point, Jackie, because I don't, I, I don't think I can answer the more specifics around that other than to say that's, that's the, the mantra that I would um, absolutely apply to uh, exercise and to, and to weightlifting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kedem, you got anything the rest of it is yeah, no, the rest of it is that uh, so exercise is, is only good, as, as John has said, and, um, uh, and exercise could not in any way um, allow granulomas to, sp to spread to other parts of the body. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody says, please, can I ask a question to Dr. Kidd? Can an eye stroke or eye palsy be due to neurosarcoidosis? This person has blurry vision and can't move both eyes together, but their sight in each eye is okay individually. So that um, uh, that can occur. Uh, well, there can be many, many reasons for that. So it, it would start at, uh, around the eye, which would be that the eye muscles are affected and that can occur. It can then uh, occur um, if the, uh, the nerves um, uh, behind the eye, uh, which go into the eye to control the muscles, are inflamed, and that's called the orbital apex. And then there's an, although you usually get loss of vision with that as well. And then the, the bit behind that then is the cavernous sinus, uh, which is adjacent to the pituitary gland that I mentioned, uh, and it can also be affected. So the answer is that uh, the, the questioner would need to um, uh, have uh, tests on that and there are doctors called neuro-ophthalmologists who'd be able to look into that in detail because they can um, uh, do measurements of the eye movements um, and the eye muscles as well but then also be able to interpret the brain scans which would be done in order to investigate it further. Thank you. 
Next question is, how do you convince local neurologists of a clear MRI doesn't mean sarcoidosis and use something else to justify the neurological symptoms, no matter how much ev evidence you can put into them that the basis of their diagnosis has issues, especially when they don't see or examine you. <laughs> the risks of not diagnosing neurosarc on not knowing carries risks. So uh, neurologists are weirdos um, and um, uh, there is a high prevalence of, um, oh, I wonder, how shall I put this? Uh, there's a high prevalence of the kind of personalities which, um, uh, which uh, um, uh, impair um, normal social interactions. Um, now, one of the reasons is that neurology is terribly interesting, and uh, but it requires a great deal of um, uh, of, of thought and introspection. You're, we're basically uh, detectives, I suppose. You know, we're relying on. Um, uh, you know, what the patient says, and well, we're meant to be relying on the examination, although the, the questioner mentions that no examination has been done. Um, and so it, it, it is very difficult. Uh, they, uh, I'm only joking about neurologists being weirdos, but, um, uh, well, partially, uh, but, um, uh, you know, it, 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 this is my experience, as I, as I mentioned in my, in, in my talk. And, um, uh, you know, I think if there was any genuine concern about it, then again, you know, if, if the questioner wanted, then uh, he or she could come and, and see me and I could work that out for myself as well. Um, uh, bearing in mind that, you know, I, I, like I said before, it's much easier whenever you've got experience of, um, of a condition, uh, whereas, um, you know, most neurologists have only seen one or two cases, if at all. Um, and, uh, and some, regrettably, are not necessarily uh, prepared to, uh, this is usually only the men, by the way, uh, to feel themselves emasculated to, to the degree that they require the help of somebody else. It's a bit like asking the way and, uh, you know, and stopping whenever they can't read a map. You know, it's the same, the same principle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question. I'm presuming that the majority of the patients are uh, female. That's why I'm allowed to say it, you see. Uh -huh. I think that one was male. <laughs> I think you've seen that one. <laughs> okay. Our question is about exercise and living with fatigue. I struggle with chronic fatigue, and each time I do exercise, I usually have to sleep for an hour or two afterwards. Any tips for how to reduce this? Um, I think it depends what exercise you're doing, Leo, and, and my advice would be that and it comes back to the point I made that people do get quite obsessed with some of the guidelines. Uh, and I saw a question about somebody who's doing 20 minutes of exercise and feeling fatigued for some time after it. Don't be afraid to reduce the amount of exercise that you're doing until you find that you have a level of fatigue that is manageable. And, and let's be honest, fatigue does go, it's, it's part of exercise. You will feel tired after exercise. That's, that's a fairly normal thing. It's having manageable fatigue, tolerable fatigue. So don't be afraid to reduce the intensity and the length of the exercise that you are doing until you get to a level of fatigue that is manageable. Um, but my, my advice would be don't let, the, if you can, don't let the fatigue put you off doing the exercise. Because as I said right from the start of my talk, the body is designed to exercise. If we don't exercise, the body will deteriorate and as anybody with sarcoidosis, the last thing you want is a body that has deteriorated physiologically um, because of a lack of exercise, because that will just make your tolerance of the condition even less. Okay. The next question is, uh, well, I'm not sure that there is an, a question here. The statement is, my neurosarcoidosis was confirmed by intracranial biopsy. And I started on infliximab, but I had problems with my immune system causing multiple hospital inpatient stays with pneumonia. So I'm now on prednisolone and methotrexate. I don't actually see the question. Yeah, I think that's more, more just a comment than a question. Um, but shall I, shall I talk about that? Yeah, uh, so yeah. The, uh, 
the, uh, th this is one of the, the drawbacks about um, uh, infliximab, um, uh, but it also um, uh, puts forward the point that it, it's very important to understand that, uh, that infliximab is only used for a certain amount of time. If it's used for very prolonged periods of time, the prevalence of infection increases and increases and increases. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, every time you have an infection, then, of course, the sarcoidosis gets um, reactivated. And so that the infliximab becomes... Uh, less uh, effective. So the best way to deal with it is to use it for a relatively short space of time. Now, short in the sarcoidosis world, of course, is two years, maybe two and a half, possibly three. But if you give it uh, for more than, you know, four or five, then uh, I th it's my uh, experience that inevitably uh, repeated infections would occur. And if that's the case here, then it should be that the, the, um, the infliximab was given skillfully and properly, uh, and then the inflammation the brain is now gone, which would mean then that steroids and methotrexate are, are the only treatments now required, which would mean then that the risk of, of developing further infections would be much reduced. Thank you. Um, our next question. I used to be quite fit and healthy. My pain has increased to a level where exercise is extremely painful in my joints. My consultant will not prescribe immunosuppressants, which I believe will help me. What do you suggest I do? If, if I just talk about the exercise part of that, Leo, again, um, there may be some, if you like, self-experimentation that this person can do to reduce the exercise that they're doing until the pain re reduces. Um, and don't be afraid to do what might seem to be low intensity, light exercise, if it's not causing the pain, because it will, the exercise itself will still be beneficial. Um, it may be that you, you want to talk, you want to go and join a local Pilates class as well, for example, where you can get really good core stability, get a form of exercise that is not putting that pressure through, through the joints. And even as we've discussed earlier, something like swimming, which is non-weight bearing, might be a form of exercise that doesn't produce the pain in the joints. So I think there is an element of, uh, I use the phrase again, self-experimentation that you can do both to reduce the intensity, reduce the, the, the exercise, and look at different forms of exercise, of which there are many out there that may well be beneficial, but uh, although they may not um, mitigate, reduce the pain completely, could well reduce it. So that, that would be my, my answer to that. What about if, um, I mean, the, the whole idea is to get more oxygen into the body. Um, what about the uh, pulmonary uh, rehab and, uh, of course, you're not allowed to sing anymore, so uh, playing the bagpipes, etc. cetera, if you can <laughs> actually do. Yeah, if you can, um, <laughs> that may well be beneficial. And there are certainly other ways in which you can. I mean, even today there are, uh, exercise devices that can help you um, develop lung function and so on. So yeah, don't um, don't be put off with doing anything. I, the only th point I would just make there is that yes, of course, exercise is about getting air and oxygen into the lungs, but it is also about strengthening the muscles, using the joints, um, making the, the nervous system work. So if you like passive techniques, I would hesitate to say that playing the bagpipes is passive, um, may not be quite as beneficial as exercise where you are inducing movement, um, even if it's body weight supported movement, as opposed to simply just um, breathing in and out in, in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, but if, if anything that's being described as extremely painful, they, that patient should stop and, and, and try a different approach. Yeah, absolutely. It all comes back to listening to your body. And, and I've made the point, no pain, no gain is a complete nonsense listen to your body if it becomes too painful back off reduce that's your body saying to you hang on this is too much or it's the wrong thing thank you and so this patient thinks that um immune suppressants will will help them with this pain when they're exercising would you agree with that patient dr kitt yes yeah okay jackie uh, do you want to ask the next question Yes, yeah, so this is a, bit, a long one. Um, I now have the involvement of a respiratory consultant along with my rheumatologist, who is my main consultant, who farms me out to the other specialist depending who I need to see. However, since my diagnosis in 2010, I now have sarcoidosis in multiple areas of the body 
and do find that the neurological symptoms that continually rears its head. I've been on infliximab since early 2018, but I do find that the timings between infusions don't, does mean that by the week five or of six, I start to have increased symptoms occurring. And once I have the infusion, they do decrease. What is the least amount of time between infusions that can be given to stop or slow down these symptoms occurring? Okay. So um, uh, the, the least amount of time is, is four weeks, but uh, I refer to my uh, previous um, uh, uh, answer about um, uh, the fact that if you've been on it for quite some time, then you can start getting complications like um, um, uh, in, infections um, uh, and the like. Um, uh, and um, uh, can everyone hear? Everyone else has got frozen, so um, can you hear me still? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone else went frozen. I wasn't quite sure if I was uh, making any sense or not. Um, uh, so uh, the, the question is, um, why is the uh, the sarcoid still active after all of the all of this treatment? One of the reasons may be uh, that uh, there isn't any um, steroid in the background. Often a little bit in the background is, is often helpful, even if it's only three or four or five milligrams. The other would be that the dose of the immune suppressant is not sufficient as well. I think methotrexate was mentioned, um, uh, but uh, you know it, we don't always uh, we're not always able to cut it down uh, to you know low levels whilst people are taking infliximab. Uh, and so uh, I would have thought, uh, and, so, and then there's another problem with infliximab then, which is that you can develop antibody formation to it and then it stops working. So the antibody then is generated against the infliximab. So then you only get a benefit of it for a couple of days. For example, the antibodies then remove the infliximab from your body. So therefore uh, the effect wears off. And so the, the, um, the question would need then to uh, check up on the steroid dose, uh, the dose of methotrexate, and then a blood test, which is done prior to the infliximab infusion, which is called the infliximab serum uh, profile, which is the concentration of infliximab in the over two, um, and also the uh, an absence of infliximab antibodies. Right, I believe that they're on a reducing dose of steroids, but no mention of methotrexate. Do you introduce yeah. methotrexate? So Yes, uh, so not everybody does, but I, I, I very strongly believe that uh, it, it needs to be, methotrexate or mycophenolate needs to be used alongside um, infliximab. There are two reasons. One is that if it's severe enough to warrant infliximab, then infliximab and steroids on their own won't be enough to settle it. And the, third, uh, the second is uh, that it's known to prevent the development of uh, anti-infliximab antibodies if you take a, uh, an immune suppressant medication alongside the uh, infliximab. Good. Right, so our next question is back on the topic of exercise. Kind of similar to a previous question we've had, but a little different, so, so we'll, we'll ask it. I'm a strong believer in exercise and I strive to manage my symptoms for pulmonary sarcoidosis through my regular gym sessions. However, continued exercise, mainly cardiovascular, gives me chest pain with increased fatigue. The onset of chest pain following exercise is managed with BP tablets and a steroid inhaler. However, I do still feel tired after three days of doing 20 minute exercises. Would other forms of exercise be better? I am not keen no, on- Sorry, Sorry. I, I was reading this. I don't think there's anything else that we need to cover really, just that they don't want to do, they don't want to do fitness classes because of the two meter. Okay, yeah, I was, re I was reading this question uh, on the Facebook site just at the moment, I've been waiting for it to come up. Um, firstly, obviously chest pain and exercise is something that always rings alarm bells and making sure that that is properly looked into uh, and, and assessed. And, you know, we've only recently seen Christian Eriksson playing for Denmark and the potential issues that anybody can face. So please do make sure that you have been properly diagnosed. Secondly, um, it comes back to the point that I've made before, 20 minutes of exercise, I think it was that the person is doing. Don't be afraid to reduce that. Self-experiment, drop down from 15, sorry, from 20 to 15, if necessary, 15 to 10, and, and see how you respond to that. Um, you said that the person was going into the gym. Um, Yes, gyms have been a, a phenomenon that have, you know, 
growing exponentially, I think, in the last sort of 20 or 30 years. But there are other forms of exercise, and particularly at the moment when it's, it's daylight for a long period of time, most of us have a great, great outdoor environment where you can go out, exercise um, on, on your own or within a group, um, cycle, run, walk, jog, whatever it might be. Um, find a friend to exercise with or indeed do something like an exercise class where you're in with a group. Um, you don't have to go into a gym in order to be able to exercise. So um, find what works for you, which is again what I said as part of the presentation. Thank you, John. Um, the next question is for Dr. Kidd. I was aware of my sarcoidosis when I lost 50% of the field of view in both eyes in 2013. But this alone cleared this up, but in 2019, I lost the sight in my left eye completely over three weeks. Again, a spike in steroid cured this quickly. Is this a common symptom? Uh, yes. Uh, so the the um, um, it sounds like the inflammation is probably um, uh, around the pituitary gland, just behind the eyes. That's why you get half of the vision going on on, on both sides. Then uh, what's happened is then uh, it sounds like the patient's been treated with steroids, um, uh, and then things have improved. But then uh, there's been no follow up um, treatment after that to actually treat the disease itself. So then the disease has recurred uh, which, without treatment, which has allowed uh, uh, the, the vision to be lost and in a slightly separate place. It would have moved further forwards from where it was um, uh, at the beginning. So then if um, uh, it's treated with steroids and happily uh, if it improves again, uh, if uh, the patient doesn't then receive treatment for the sarcoidosis, which they haven't received yet because all they've had is steroids, uh, and uh, they, they run the risk that this is going to continue to occur and conceivably uh, that the situation could actually um, become um, irreparable. So they need to look at the scans in detail um, and they need to make an uh, adjustment uh, to the treatment, bearing in mind this is now officially relapsing disorder, uh, which, which won't therefore um, uh, necessarily switch itself off automatically just with steroids. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Um, another question for Dr. Kidd. Is the locking of fingers and the locking of toes symptoms of neurosarcoidosis? Uh, the locking of fingers and toes. Um, it, it can it can occur with neuropathy, um, and it can also occur if there are problems with you know low calcium levels, low not high, uh, low calcium levels, and sometimes potassium levels as well. So um, a couple of simple tests could be done first with the GP, just some regular blood tests and things like that. Uh, and then um, uh, perhaps with a neurologist checking over for symptoms or signs of neuropathy, they can do a test called a nerve conduction test, which would involve um, an electromyogram as well, which could actually measure what kind of uh, spasms are occurring in the uh, in hands and feet. I don't think it's anything more what we call central, so I don't think it's in the spinal cord or in the brain uh, because that would cause other symptoms. It wouldn't just cause the muscles to, to cramp up in that way. Thank you. Another one for you, Dr. Kidd. Have you ever had any neurosarcoid patients that presented with action-induced clonus in the lower limbs? Yes. So, so it's, 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 it's a very common uh, feature of, of spinal cord involvement. And I suppose it could also, it can also occur with brain involvement as well. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what they mean about action induced. I presume that means that the clonus occurs whenever the, uh, the muscles are being used. Um, but uh, again, a, a neurologist would be able to find that out. And there are neurophysiological investigations which could be done, which would define the, the region. But of course, also imaging would presumably define the region um, uh, as well. But it definitely needs to be looked into. Okay, um, we have, let's do one more question, I think, and then I think we'll have to draw this to a close. Um, our last question is, I have been feeling a tightness on the right side of my neck slash throat, which is very uncomfortable. I do suffer from 
hemicrania continua. Is this a neuro problem? <laughs> um, so it can be, yes. So hemicrania continua um, is a, a one-sided headache which is continuous. So they, one of the fun things about um, uh, medicine is that in the good old days, you had to learn ancient Greek and Latin in order to get into medical school. Uh, and so then they decided they would invent, um, uh, they would just talk to each other over the head of the patient using Latin and Greek terms. And so they're all um, uh, Latin and Greek, uh, Greek terms, which is very interesting for colleagues of mine from Greece, because they all uh, realize that actually not only are they uh, bad Greek, but also that we mispronounce the, um, uh, the conditions as well. Um, so, um, so that's what hemicrania continua is. If you had uh, with that pachymeningitis that I mentioned earlier on, only on one side, then that could produce the symptom of hemicrania continua. Now, um, if there's pain and stiffness in the neck, then a much more common cause of hemicrania continua is simply that there's a spasm of, of the neck muscle, which then spreads up to the muscles of the scalp, which then has a tendency to pull back. And patients often have this sensation that they get a, sort of a pulling back, which starts in the eyebrow and goes all the way back and into the neck. And then often right at the very back of the head where the muscles of the neck join the skull is often quite uh, tender. So if the patient feels that to see um, if that is tender, then I don't, and if it was, then I don't think they would need to worry that they had a pachymeningitis or anything like that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will unfortunately have to draw it to a close there because I don't want us to overrun. But on behalf of the charity, I want to say a huge massive thank you to all of the speakers here today so to professor brewer and to dr kidd for really giving such fascinating talks and giving such great answers during the q a session and during the discussion and also a huge thank you to jackie who plays such a huge part in, in delivering these patient days year after year and um, so thank you so so much to all of you i would also like to say a big thank you to charlene who isn't on the screen today, but is actually working really hard in the office on a Saturday, making sure that this can happen and, and, and doing everything behind the scenes so that we can be streaming live to you all. But I really do mean that this has been a fantastic day. It's been great to be, to be here with you all. And if any of the speakers today get a chance at some point to have a look at the comments on, on Facebook and YouTube, you'll see how, just how much people have really appreciated you giving up your time today. So thank you so much. Um, Jackie, have you got anything else you'd like to add? No, just same as you said. Thanks, everyone. It's uh, you too, Leo. <laughs> it's it's so great to be able to put this out to patients who maybe can't see a, a neuro doctor, don't have a fitness expert to to help them through this. And uh, uh, I'm sure we we will see all these uh, comments that are appreciative. Yeah, please do have a look at them. And just one thing to the people watching, we've still had a couple of comments of people asking, can I rewatch this? Can I rewatch this? The answer is yes, you, you can absolutely rewatch this as many times as you like. Um, so it will, it will stay, stay there for you to watch. Um, so I think that's everything covered. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been great, uh, a really great day. And, and thank you once again to our fantastic speakers today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone, thanks Leo. Thanks,